his name. What do you want to do tonight? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. Honestly, this is one of the greatest books in regards to beliefs and how our beliefs shape our reality. This is the first book that I read that mentions the intelligence of each cell, each molecule. It has intelligence. Enjoy this timeless classic. Do me a favor. Comment what you learned from this audiobook. You might want to listen to it again. And I also included a list of affirmations at the end. Enjoy. Chapter one, your personal reality. Your conscious thoughts can be great clues in uncovering such obstructions. You are not nearly as familiar with your own thoughts as you may imagine. They can escape from you like water through your fingers, carrying with them vital nutrients that spread across the landscape of your psyche and all too often carrying sludge and mud that clog up the channels of experience and creativity. An examination of your conscious thoughts will tell you much about the state of your inner mind, your intentions and expectations, and will often lead you to a direct confrontation with challenges and problems. Your thoughts studied will let you see where you are going. They point clearly to the nature of physical events. What exists physically exists first in thought and feeling. There is no other rule. You have the conscious mind for a good reason. You are not at the mercy of unconscious drives unless you consciously acquiesce to them. Your present feelings and expectations can always be used to check your progress. If you do not like your experience, then you must change the nature of your conscious thoughts and expectations. You must alter the kind of messages that you are sending through your thoughts to your own body, to friends and associates. Each thought has a result. In your terms, the same kind of thought, habitually repeated, will seem to have a more or less permanent effect. If you like the effect, then you seldom examine the thought. If you find yourself assailed by physical difficulties, however, you begin to wonder what is wrong. Sometimes you blame others, your own background or a previous life, if you accept reincarnation. You may hold God or the devil responsible, or you may simply say, that is life and accept the negative experience as a necessary portion of your lot. You may finally come to a half understanding of the nature of reality and wail. I believe that I have caused these ill effects, but I find myself unable to reverse them. If this is the case, then regardless of what you have told yourself thus far, you still do not believe that you are the creator of your own experience. As soon as you recognize this fact, you can begin at once to alter those conditions that cause you dismay or dissatisfaction. A one-minute pause at 9.49, no one forces you to think in any particular manner. In the past, you may have learned to consider things pessimistically. You may believe that pessimism is more realistic than optimism. You may even suppose, and many do, that sorrow is ennobling, a sign of deep spiritualism, a mark of apartness, a necessary mental garb of saints and poets. Nothing could be further from the truth. All consciousness has within it the deep abiding impetus to use it abilities fully to expand its capacities, to venture joyfully beyond the seeming barriers of its own experience. The very consciousnesses within the smallest molecules cry out against any ideas of limitation. They yearn toward new forms and experiences. Even atoms, then, constantly seek to join in new organizations of structure and meaning. They do this instinctively. Man has been endowed and has endowed himself with a conscious mind to direct the nature, shape and form of his creations. All deep aspirations and unconscious motivations, all unspoken drives, rise up for the approval or disapproval of the conscious mind and await its direction. Only when it abdicates its functions does it allow itself to become swayed by negative experience 
Only when it refuses responsibility does it finally find itself at the seeming mercy of events over which it appears to have no control. Now you may take your break. Now, books on positive thinking alone, while sometimes beneficial, usually do not take into consideration the habitual nature of negative feelings, aggressions, or repressions. Aggressions, often these are merely swept under the rug. The authors instead tell you to be positive, compassionate, strong, optimistic, filled with joy and enthusiasm, without telling you what to do to get out of the predicament you may be in and without understanding the vicious circle that may seem to entrap you. Such books, again, while sometimes of value, do not explain how thoughts and emotions cause reality. They do not take into consideration the multidimensional aspects of the self or the fact that ultimately each personality, while following definite general laws, must still find and follow his or her own way of adapting these to personal circumstances. If you are in poor health, you can remedy it. If your personal relationships are unsatisfactory, you can change them for the better. If you are in poverty, you can instead find yourself surrounded by abundance. Whether or not you realize it, you have pursued your present course with determination, using many resources, for ends or reasons that at one time made sense to you. You may say, poor health makes no sense to me, or a fractured relationship with my mate is hardly what I was after, or I certainly have not been pursuing poverty after all my hard work. If you were born poor or born sick, then it certainly seems to you that these circumstances were thrust upon you. Yet they were not, and to some extent or another they can be changed for the better. This does not mean that effort is not required and determination. It does mean that you are not powerless to change events and that each of you, regardless of your position, status, circumstances or physical condition, is in control of your own personal experience. You see and feel what you expect to see and feel. The world as you know it is a picture of your expectations. The world as the race of man knows it is the materialization and mass of your individual expectations. As children come from your physical tissues, so is the world your joint creation. 10. 26. Pause. Then softly, with a smile, I am writing this book to help each individual solve his or her own personal problems. I hope to do this by showing you exactly the way in which you form your own reality, by explaining the ways in which you can alter it to your advantage. The existence of so-called negative thoughts and feelings will not be glossed over, but neither will your ability to handle these, period, for they are quite under your control. There are methods of using these as springboards for creativity. At no time will you be told to repress them, to ignore them. You will be shown how to recognize those within your experience, to discover which of them has been allowed to run away with you and how to manage those that seem to be beyond your control. The methods that I will outline demand concentration and effort. They will also challenge you and bring into your life expansion and alterations of consciousness of a most rewarding nature. I am not a physical personality. Basically, however, neither are you. Your experience now is physical. You are a creator translating your expectations into physical form. The world is meant to serve as a reference point. The exterior appearance is a replica of inner desire. You can change your personal world. You do change it without knowing it. You have only to use your ability consciously to examine the nature of your thoughts and feelings and project those with which you basically agree. They coalesce into the events with which you are so intimately familiar. I hope to teach you methods that will allow you to understand the nature of your own reality and to point a way that will let you change that reality in whatever way you choose. Louder. End of dictation. Okay, you're pretty tricky starting your book like that. Pleasantly. That is my way. I will give you the title and other pertinent information in a later session. And if you want it, an outline of intent, 
I guess Jane would like to see that. Let us have this one as simple as possible. Give us a moment. Still in trance, Jane took a long pause at 10.37. Her eyes closed. She sat rocking back and forth with one foot upon the edge of the coffee table. The book will explain how personal reality is formed, with great stress laid upon the ways of changing unfavorable aspects of individual experience. It will, hopefully, avoid the Pollyanna attributes of many self-help books and tease the reader into an enthusiastic desire to understand the characteristics of reality, if only to solve his or her own problems. The methods given will be highly practical, workable, and within the abilities of any person genuinely concerned with those problems inherent in the nature of human existence. The point will be made that all healings are the result of the acceptance of one basic fact. That matter is formed by those inner qualities that give it vitality, that structure follows expectation, that matter at any time can be completely changed by the activation of the creative faculties, inherent in all consciousness. Please title what we have done this evening as my preface, the dictated portion, that is, the living picture of the world grows within the mind. The world as it appears to you is like a three-dimensional painting in which each 2-2A two, two individual takes a hand, each colour, each colour, each colour, each line that appears within it has first been painted within a mind and only then does it materialise without. In this case, however, the artists themselves are a portion of the painting and appear within it. There is no effect in the exterior world that does not spring from an inner source. There is no motion that does not first occur within the mind. The great creativity of consciousness is your heritage. It does not belong to mankind alone, however. Each living being possesses it, and the living world consists of a spontaneous cooperation that exists between the smallest and the highest, the greatest and the lowly, between the atoms and the molecules, and the conscious reasoning mind. All manner of insects, birds and beasts cooperate in this venture, producing the natural environment. This is as normal and inevitable as the fact that your breath causes a mist to form on glass if you breathe upon it. All consciousness creates the world, rising out of feeling, tone. It is a natural product of what your consciousness is. Feelings and emotions emerge into reality in certain specific ways. Thoughts appear growing on the bed already laid. The seasons spring up, formed by ancient feeling tones, having deep and abiding rhythms. They are the result, again, of innate creative aspects that are a portion of all life. These ancient aspects lie now, deeply buried in the psyches of all species, and from them, the individual patterns, the specific blueprints for new differentiations, emerge. The body of the earth can be said to have its own soul, or mind, whichever term you prefer. Using this analogy, the mountains and oceans, the valleys and rivers, and all natural phenomena spring from the earth's soul, as all events and all manufactured objects appear from the inner mind or soul of mankind. The inner world of each man and woman is connected with the inner world of the earth, the spirit becomes flesh. Part of each individual soul, then, is intimately connected with what we will call the world soul or the soul of the earth. The smallest blade of grass or flower is aware of this connection and without reasoning comprehends its position, its uniqueness and its source of vitality. The atoms and molecules that compose all objects, whether it be the body of a person, a table, a stone or a frog know the great passive thrust of creativity that lies beneath their own existence and upon which their individuality floats, distinct, clear and unassailable. So does the human individual rise up in victorious distinctiveness from the ancient and yet ever new fountains of its own soul. The self rises from unknowing into knowing, constantly surprising itself. As you read these sentences, for example, 
Some of your knowledge is conscious knowing and is instantly available. Some is unconscious, but even the unconscious knowledge is knowing in its own unknowing. You always know what you are doing, even when you do not realize it. Your eye knows it sees, though it cannot see itself except through the use of reflection. In the same way, the world as you see it is a reflection of what you are, a reflection not in glass, but in three-dimensional reality. You project your thoughts, feelings, and expectations outward. Then you perceive them as the outside reality. When it seems to you that others are observing you, you are observing yourself from the standpoint of your own projections. Now you may take a break. Nine forty-six to ten nine. Now you are the living picture of yourself. You project what you think you are outward into flesh. Your feelings, your conscious and unconscious thoughts, all alter and form your physical image. This is fairly easy for you to understand. It is not as easy, however, to realize that your feelings and thoughts form your exterior experience in the same way, or that the events that appear to happen to you, or that the events that appear to happen to you, or initiated by you within your mental or psychic inner environment. Your body does not just happen to be thin or fat, tall or short, healthy or ill. These characteristics are mental. And are thrust outward by you upon your image. I do not mean to be facetious, but you were not born yesterday. Your soul was not born yesterday in those terms, but before the annals of time, as you think of time. The characteristics that were yours at birth were yours for a reason. The inner self chose them. To a large extent, the inner self can even now alter many of them. You did not arrive at birth without a history. Your individuality was always latent within your soul, and the history that is a part of you is written within unconscious memory that resides not only within your psyche, but is faithfully decoded in your genes and chromosomes, and fulfilled in the blood that rushes through your veins. You are aware, alert. And participating in many more realities than you know, as your soul expresses itself through you. That consciousness of your usual daylight hours, the ego consciousness rises up like a flower from the ground of the underneath, the unconscious bed of your own reality. Though you are not aware of it, this ego itself emerges, then falls back again into the unconscious. From which another ego then rises as a new bloom from the springtime earth. Ten twenty-seven. You do not have the same ego now that you had five years ago, but you are not aware of the change. Ego rises out of what you are. In other words, it is a part of the action of your being and consciousness. But as the eye cannot see its own shifting colors and expressions. As it is not aware that it lives and dies constantly as its atomic structure changes, so you are not aware that the ego continually changes, dies, and is reborn. Physically, the structure of a cell retains its identity, even while the matter that composes it is continually altered. The cell rebuilds itself in line with its own pattern of identity, yet is always a part of emerging action. Alive and responding, even in the midst of its own multitudinous deaths, so psychological structures form to which various names are given. The names are meaningless, but the structures behind them are not. Such psychological structures also retain their identity, their pattern of uniqueness, even while they change constantly, die and are reborn. The eye rises out of the physical structure. The ego rises out of the structure of the psyche. It cannot see itself as the eye cannot. Both look outward, in one case away from the physical body, and in the other case away from the physical body, and in the other case away from the environment. The creative body consciousness creates the eye. The creative inner psyche creates the ego. The body forms the eye and the splendid wisdom of its great unconscious knowing. The psyche brings forth the ego that perceives psychologically. As the eye perceives physically, both the eye and the ego are formations focused toward perception of exterior reality. You may take your break. 
Now, this is not book dictation. Rupert was correct in the insight of a few moments earlier, during break. In my book, we will be going deeper into the nature of the unconscious and the psyche, bringing out some concepts that are of greatest value. Rupert himself, unconsciously but also to some extent consciously, has been more intrigued with questions concerning consciousness and personality. The role of the ego consciousness, for example, much is not as yet known. Your psychologists are not able to think in terms of a soul, and your religious leaders are not able or refuse to comprehend it psychologically, even to its simplest degree, metaphysics and psychology have not met, in other words. Now, I am, as I have told you often myself, independent of Rupert. As you know, there are connections between us. He does not understand as yet the true nature of his own creativity. Few people do. There are always psychological reasons for all such phenomena, for any phenomena at all. In some respects, of course, Rupert's children are his books. His psyche is enormously creative. Part of what I seem to be as I speak through him is as deeply and unconsciously a phenomenon as the birth of a child would be. In a different way, so is Oversoul 7, as he thinks of it. These are not physical children at the mercy of time and the elements, but eternal ones, more knowledgeable than the parent. God springing from the human psyche, half human, half divine. And on this level, the parent is astonished, delighted at the superior accomplishments of its children, the superiority of the offspring, and yet also jealous to some extent. If the books are children symbolically, then in those same terms, his representation of my reality is a far more living, three-dimensional aspect. He has at various times wondered about schizophrenia, for example. He does not realize that on this level now, and regardless of my independence and other issues involved, that he creates the personalities free of time, organizes them under the leadership of the conscious mind, and assigns them tasks of great validity and importance, which are then carried out. This is creativity of a most specialized nature and allows him to probe, if he will, into the nature of consciousness, the psyche and creativity in a way that few can. Now he himself set up the conditions that would make such results possible. A certain part of my reality is a portion of a certain part of his reality, and here the creation of what I seem to be takes place. Beyond that is my own independent reality. I will have more to say and add to these notes so that they will build up by themselves. They're very interesting. If Rupert would regard his problems as challenges, then he would get much better results. Punctuation easy. The copy is concise. After an occasional correction, it's ready for publication. Your experience in the world of physical matter flows outward from the center of your inner psyche. Then you perceive this experience. Exterior events, circumstances and conditions are meant as a kind of living feedback. Altering the state of the psyche automatically alters the physical circumstances. There is no other valid way of changing physical events. It might help if you imagine an inner living dimension within yourself in which you create, in miniature psychic form, all the exterior conditions that you know. Simply put, you do exactly this. Your thoughts, feelings and mental pictures can be called incipient exterior events. For in one way or another, each of these is materialized into physical reality. You change even the most permanent seeming conditions of your life constantly through the varying attitudes you have toward them. There is nothing in your exterior experience that did not originate within you. Interactions with others do occur, of course, yet there are none that you do not accept or draw to you by your thoughts, attitudes or emotions. This applies in each area of life. In your terms, it applies both before life and after it. In the most miraculous fashion are you given the gift of creating your experience. In this existence, you are learning to handle the inexhaustible energy that is available to you. 
The mass condition of the world and the situation of each individual in it is the materialization of man's progress as he forms his world. Nine twenty four. The joy of creativity flows through you as effortlessly as your breath. From it, the most minute areas of your outer experience spring. Your feelings have electromagnetic realities that rise outward, affecting the atmosphere itself. They group through attraction, building up areas of events and circumstances that finally coalesce, so to speak, either in matter as objects or as events in time. Some feelings and thoughts are translated into structures that you call objects. These exist, in your terms, in a medium you call space. Others are translated instead into psychological structures called events that seem to exist in a medium you call time. Space and time are both root assumptions, which simply means that man accepts both and assumes that his reality is rooted in a series of moments and a dimension of space. So your inner experience is translated in those terms. Even the duration of an event or object in space or time is determined by the intensity of the thoughts or emotions that gave it birth. Duration in space is not the same as duration in time. However, though ever though and ten ten, it may seem that this is the case. I am speaking in your terms now. An event or object that exists briefly in space may have a much greater duration in time. It may have far greater duration in time. It may have far greater importance and intensity, existing in your memory, for example, long after it has disappeared in space. Such an event or object does not merely exist symbolically within your mind or memory, but in your terms, its actual reality continues as a time event. Nor is its reality in space annihilated as long as it exists within your mind. Let us take a very simple example. A child has been told not to play with a doll. The order is disobeyed. The child, wittingly or unwittingly, breaks the doll, and it is finally thrown away. The doll exists in time quite vitally as long as the child or the adult. To be remembers it. If the doll sat on a bureau and this is also vividly recalled, then the space in which the doll sat still carries the impression of the doll, though other objects may be placed there. You react, therefore, not only to what is visible to your physical eyes in space or to what is directly in front of you in time, but also to objects and events whose reality is still with you, though they may seem to have disappeared. Basically, you create your experience through your beliefs about yourself and the nature of reality. Another way to understand this is to realize that you create your expectations through your expectation. Your feeling tones are your emotional attitudes toward yourself and life in general, and these generally govern the large areas of experience. Pause. They give the overall emotional coloration that characterizes what happens to you. Period. You are what happens to you. Your emotional feelings are often transitory, but beneath there are certain qualities of feeling uniquely your own that are like deep musical chords. While your day-to-day -day feelings may rise or fall, these characteristic feeling tones lie beneath. Sometimes they rise to the surface. But in great long rhythms, you cannot call these negative or positive. They are instead tones of your being. They represent the most inner portion of your experience. This does not mean that they are hidden from you or are meant to be. It simply means that they represent the core from which you form your experience. If you have become afraid of emotion or the expression of feeling. Or if you have been taught that the inner self is no more than a repository, eleven a repository idemied of uncivilized impulses, then you may have the habit of denying this deep rhythm. You may try to operate as if it did not exist, or even try to refute it, but it represents your deepest, most creative impulses. To fight against it is like trying to swim upstream against a strong current. Now you may take your break. These feeling tones then pervade your being, 
They are the form your spirit takes when combined with flesh. From them, from their core, your flesh arises. Everything that you experience has consciousness, and each consciousness is endowed with its own feeling, tone. There is great cooperation involved in the formation of the earth as you think of it, and so the individual living structures of the planet rise up from the feeling, tone within each atom and molecule. Your flesh springs about you in response to these inner chords of your being, and the trees, rocks, seas and mountains spring up as the body of the earth from the deep inner chords within the atoms and molecules, which are also living. Because of the creative cooperation that exists, the miracle of physical materialization is performed so smoothly and automatically that consciously you are not aware of your part in it. The feeling, tone then, is the motion and fiber, the timber, the portion of your energy devoted to your physical experience. Now it flows into what you are as a physical being and materializes you in the world of seasons, space, flesh and time. Its source, however, is quite independent of the world that you know. Once you learn to get the feeling of your own inner tone, then you are aware of its power, strength and durability, and you can, to some extent, ride with it into deeper realities of experience. The incredible emotional richness and variety and splendor of physical experience is the material reflection of this inner feeling, tone. It pervades the events in your life, the overall inner direction, the quality of perception. It fills up and illuminates the individual aspects of your life and largely determines the persuasive subjective climate in which you dwell. It is the essence of yourself. Its sweeps are broad in range, however. It does not determine, for example, specific events, pause. It paints the colors in the large landscape of your experience. It is the feeling of yourself, inexhaustible. In other terms, it represents the expression of yourself in pure energy, from which your individuality rises, the you of you unmistakably given identity that is never duplicated. This energy comes from the core of being, in capital letters, from all that is with our usual capitals, and represents the source of never-ending vitality. It is being being in you. As such, all of the energy and power of being is focused and reflected through you in the direction of your three-dimensional existence. You may take your break. While you're feeling, tone is uniquely yours. Still, it is expressed in a certain fashion that is shared by all consciousnesses focused in physical reality. So, in those terms you spring from the earth as all the other creatures and natural living structures, you are, while physical, a portion of nature, therefore not apart from it. Trees and rocks possess their own consciousness and also share a gestalt consciousness, even as the living portions of your body. The cells and organs have their own awarenesses and a gestalt one. So the race of man also has individual consciousness and a gestalt or mass consciousness of which you individually are hardly aware. The mass race consciousness, in its terms, possesses an identity. You are a portion of that identity while still being unique, individual and independent. You are confined only to the extent that you have chosen physical reality and so placed yourself within its context of experience. While physical, you follow physical laws or assumptions. These form the framework for corporeal expression. Within this framework, you have full freedom to create your experience, your personal life in all of its aspects, the living picture of the world. Your personal life and, to some extent, your individual living experience help create the world as it is known in your time. In this book, we will be speaking about your own subjective world and your part in the creation of events both private and shared. It is important before we continue that you realize that consciousness is within all physical phenomena. However, it is vital that you realize your position within nature. Nature is created from within. 
The personal life that you know rises up from within you, yet it is given. Period. Since you are a part of being, then in a certain fashion you give yourself the life that is being lived through you. Cause. New paragraph. You make your own reality. There is no other rule. Knowing this is the secret of creativity. I have spoken of you, yet this must not be confused with the you. That you often think you are the ego alone, for the ego is only a portion of you. It is that expert part of your personality that deals directly with the contents of your conscious mind and is concerned most directly with the material portions of your experience. The ego is a very specialized portion of your greater identity. It is a portion of you that arises to deal directly with the life that the larger you is living. The ego can feel cut off, lonely and frightened, however, if the conscious mind lets the ego run away with it. The ego and the conscious mind are not the same thing. The ego is composed of various portions of the personality. It is a combination of characteristics, ever changing, that act in unitary fashion. The portion of the personality that deals most directly with the world. Very slowly, at 11.18, the conscious mind is an excellent perceiving attribute, a function that belongs to inner awareness, but in this case is turned outward toward the world of events. Through the conscious mind, the soul looks outward. Left alone, it perceives clearly. In certain terms, the ego is the eye through which the conscious mind perceives, or the focus through which it views physical reality. But the conscious mind automatically changes its focus throughout life. The ego, while appearing the same to itself, ever changes. It is only when the conscious mind becomes rigid in its direction, or allows the ego to take on some of its own functions, that difficulties arise. Then the ego allows the conscious mind to work in certain directions and blocks its awareness in others. And so it is from your larger identity that you form the reality that you know. It is up to you to do this with joy and vigor, clearing your conscious mind so that the deeper knowledge of your greater identity can form joyous expressions in the world of the flesh. End of the chapter. End of dictation. Now, the book will enable others to help themselves and will reach a far greater audience and help more people than Rupert could meet alone or than I could help through individual sessions. Those who request help should be put on a list to make sure they know of the book. That's a good idea. By mail and telephone, Jane has been getting more requests for help than she can handle. Rupert does not need to feel he must have individual sessions then for people who must work this through alone. And now I bid you a fond good evening. The effect of the visit was good, particularly on Rupert. We will get to his scientificity and tificus questions. For Rupert's confidence, I wanted this book decently begun. Other sessions may take over from dictation now and then, but the main project will be the book. The flood material will be used as an example in the book later on, when natural disasters are discussed, so you will have that material and others may use and understand it. Chapter 2 Chapter 2 Reality and Personal Beliefs You form the fabric of your experience through your own beliefs and expectations. These personal ideas about yourself and the nature of reality will affect your thoughts and emotions. You take your beliefs about reality as truth and often do not question them. They seem self-explanatory. They appear in your mind as statements of fact far too obvious for examination. Therefore, they are accepted without qui characteristics of reality itself. Pause. Frequently such ideas appear indisputable, so a part of you that it does not occur to you to speculate about their validity. They become invisible assumptions, but they nevertheless color and form your personal experience. Some people, for example, do not question their religious beliefs, but accept them as fact. 
Others find it comparatively easy to recognize such inner assumptions when they appear in a religious context, but are quite blind to them in other areas. It is far simpler to recognize your own beliefs in regard to religion, politics, or similar subjects than it is to pinpoint your deepest beliefs about yourself and who and what you are, particularly in relationship with your own life. Many individuals are completely blind to their own beliefs about themselves and the nature of reality. Your own conscious thoughts will give you excellent clues. Often you will find yourself refusing to accept certain thoughts that come to your mind because they conflict with other usually accepted ideas. Your conscious mind is always trying to give you a clear picture, but though often allow preconceived ideas to block out this intelligence. It has been fashionable to blame the subconscious for personality problems and difficulties. The idea being that early events, charged and mysterious, lodged there. In this country, several generations grew up believing that the subconscious portions of the personality were unreliable, filled with negative energy, and contained only locked up unpleasant episodes best forgotten. They grew up believing that the conscious mind. Was relatively powerless. That adult experience was set in the days of infancy. These concepts themselves set up artificial divisions. People learned that they should not be aware of subconscious material. The doors to the inner self were to be shut tight. Only lengthy psychoanalysis could or should open them. The normal individual felt that he had best leave such areas alone. So, in cutting off these portions of the self, barriers were also set up against the joy of the inner spontaneous self. People felt divorced from the core of their own reality. The concept of original sin was a very poor, limited, and distorted one. But at least, along with it, went rather simple procedures. Through baptism, you might be saved. Or through certain words or sacraments, session too often, they are not recognized as beliefs about reality, but are instead considered or rituals. Redemption could be found. The idea of the tainted subconscious, however, left man no such relatively easy way out. The few rituals possible required years of analysis, which only the very wealthy were privileged to experience. About the same time that the idea of the unsavory subconscious arose so strongly, the idea of the soul went out the window. Millions of people therefore believed in a reality in which they were deprived of the idea of a soul and burdened by the concept of a very unreliable, if not definitely evil, subconscious. They saw themselves as vulnerable, solitary points of egos. Riding perilously and unprotected upon the tumultuous waves of involuntary processes, at about the same time, many intelligent persons were realizing that organized religions' ideas of God and of heaven and hell were distorted, unjust, and smacked of children's fairy tales. For these individuals, there was no place to look for help. Under the circumstances, to look within would have seemed foolhardy. For they had been taught that this within contained the source of their problems to begin with. Those who could not afford therapy tried the harder to inhibit any messages from the inner self, for fear they would become swallowed by the savage infantile emotions. Now, first of all, there are no limitations or divisions to the self, though for purposes of discussion, a word like ego may be used here because you understand what you think it means. You can indeed depend upon seemingly unconscious portions of yourself, as you will see later. You can become more and more consciously aware, therefore bringing into your consciousness larger and larger portions of yourself. You breathe, grow, and perform multitudinous, delicate, and precise activities constantly, without being consciously aware of how you carry out such manipulations. You live without consciously knowing how you maintain this miracle of physical of physical awareness in the world of flesh and time. The seemingly unconscious portions of yourself draw atoms and molecules from the air to form your image. 
Your lips move. Your tongue speaks your name. Does the name belong to the atoms and molecules within your lips or tongue? Cause the atoms and molecules move constantly, forming into cells, tissues, and organs. How can the name the tongue speaks belong to them? They do not read or write, yet they speak complicated syllables that communicate to other beings, such as yourself, anything from a simple feeling to the most complicated information. How do they do this? The atoms and molecules of the tongue do not know the syntax of the language they speak. When you begin a sentence, you do not have the slightest conscious idea, often, of how you will finish it. Yet you take it on faith that the words will make sense and your meaning will flow out effortlessly. All of this happens because the inner portions of your being operate spontaneously, joyfully. Freely, all of this occurs because your inner self believes in you, often even while you do not believe in it. These unconscious portions of your being operate amazingly well, frequently despite the greatest misunderstanding on your part of their nature and function, and in the face of strong interference from you because of your beliefs. Each person experiences a unique reality. Different from any other individuals, this reality springs outward from the inner landscape of thoughts, feelings, expectations, and beliefs. If you believe that the inner self works against you rather than for you, then you hamper its functioning, or rather, you force it to behave in a certain way because of your beliefs. The conscious mind is meant to make clear judgments about your position in physical reality. Often, false beliefs will prevent it from making these, for the egotistically held ideas will cloud its clear vision. I suggest a break. Your beliefs can be like fences that surround you. You must first recognize the existence of such barriers. You must see them, or you will not even realize that you are not free simply because you will not see beyond the fences. Very positively, they will represent the boundaries of your experience. There is one belief, however, that destroys artificial barriers to perception—an expanding belief that automatically pierces false and inhibiting ideas. Now, separately, the self is not limited. That statement is a statement of fact. It exists regardless of your belief or disbelief in it. Following this concept is another: there are no boundaries or separations of the self. Those that you experience are the result of false beliefs. Following this is the idea that I have already mentioned. You make your own reality to understand yourself and what you are. You can learn to experience yourself directly apart from your beliefs about yourself. What I would like each reader to do is to sit quietly, close your eyes, try to sense within yourself the deep feeling tones that I mentioned earlier. In the six hundred and thirteenth session in chapter one, this is not difficult to do. Your knowledge of their existence will help you recognize their deep rhythms within you. Each individual will sense these tones in his or her own way, so do not worry about how they should feel. Simply tell yourself that they exist, that they are composed of the great energies of your being made flesh. A twenty ye then let yourself experience. If you are used to terms like meditation, try to forget the term during this procedure. Do not use any name. Free yourself from concepts and experience the being of yourself and the motion of your own vitality. Do not question: Is this right? Am I doing it correctly? Am I feeling what I should feel? This is the book's first exercise for you. You are not to use other people's criteria. There are not to use other people's criteria. There are no standards but your own feelings. No particular time limit is recommended. This should be an enjoyable experience. Accept whatever happens as uniquely your own. The exercise will put you in touch with yourself. It will return you to yourself. Whenever you are nervous or upset, take a few moments to sense this feeling tone within you. And you will find yourself centered in your own being, secure. When you have tried this exercise several times, 
Then feel these deep rhythms go out from you in all directions, as indeed they do. Electromagnetically, they radiate out through your physical being, and in ways that I hope to explain later, they form the environment that you know even as they form your physical image. I told you that the self was not limited, yet surely you think that your self stops where your skin meets space, that you are inside your skin, period, yet your environment is an extension of your self. It is the body of your experience coalesced in physical form. The inner self forms the objects that you know as surely and automatically as it forms your finger or your eye. Your environment is the physical picture of your thoughts, emotions and beliefs made visible. Since your thoughts, emotions and beliefs move through space and time, you therefore affect physical conditions separate from you. Consider the spectacular framework of your body just from the physical standpoint. You perceive it as solid, as you perceive all other physical matter. Yet the more matter is explored, the more obvious it becomes that within it, energy takes on specific shape in the form of organs, cells, molecules, atoms, electrons, 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 ES physical than the last, each combining in mystery, to start to form matter. The atoms within your body spin. There is constant commotion and activity. The flesh that seemed so solid turns out to be composed of swiftly moving particles, often orbiting each other in IT21, in which great exchanges of energy continually occur. The stuff, the space outside of your body, is composed of the same elements, but in different proportions. There is a constant physical interchange between the structure you call your body and the space outside it. Chemical interactions, basic exchanges without which life as you know it would be impossible. To hold your breath is to die. Breath, which represents the most intimate and most necessary of your physical sensations, must flow out from what you are, passing into the world that seems to be not you. Physically, portions of you leave your body constantly and intermix with the elements. You know what happens when adrenaline is released through the bloodstream. It stirs you up and prepares you for action. But in other ways, the adrenaline does not just stay in your body. It is cast into the air and it affects the atmosphere, though it is transformed. Any of your emotions liberate hormones but these also leave you as your breath leaves you. And in that respect, you can say that you release chemicals into the air that then affect it. Physical storms, then, are caused by such interactions. I am telling you that you form your own reality once again, and this includes the physical weather, which is the result, en masse, of your individual reactions I will elaborate much more specifically on this particular point later in the book. You are in physical existence to learn and understand that your energy, translated into feelings, thoughts and emotions, causes all experience. There are no exceptions. Once you understand this, you have only to learn to examine the nature of your beliefs, for these will automatically cause you to feel and think in certain fashions. Your emotions follow your beliefs. It is not the other way around. I would like you to recognize your own beliefs in several areas. You must realize that any idea you accept as truth is a belief that you hold. You must then take the next step and say, it is not necessarily true, even though I believe it. You will, I hope, Learn to disregard all beliefs that imply basic limitations. You may take your break. Physical data will always seem to reinforce the beliefs, therefore, but the beliefs form the reality. We are going to attempt to knock down such limiting concepts. First of all, you must realize that no one can change your beliefs for you, nor can they be forced upon you from without. You can indeed change them for yourself, however, with knowledge and application. Look about you. Your entire physical environment is the materialization of your beliefs. 
your sense of joy, sorrow, health or illness. All of these are also caused by your beliefs. If you believe that a given situation should make you unhappy, then it will and the unhappiness will then reinforce the condition. Within you is the ability to change your ideas about reality and about yourself to create a personal living experience that is fulfilling to yourself and others. I would like you to write down your beliefs about yourself as you become aware of them. Later, you can use this list in a way that you do not now suspect, break or end of session, whatever you prefer. Your conscious beliefs direct the functioning of your body. It is not the other way around. Your inner self adopts the physically conscious, physically focused mind as a method of allowing it to manipulate in the world that you know. The conscious mind is particularly equipped to direct outward activity, to handle waking experience and oversee physical work. Its beliefs about the nature of reality are then given to inner portions of the self. These rely mainly upon the conscious mind's interpretation of temporal reality. The conscious mind sets the goals and the inner self brings them about using all its facilities and inexhaustible energy. The great value of the conscious mind lies precisely in its ability to make decisions and set directions. Its role is dual, however. It is meant to assess conditions both inside and outside to handle data that comes from the physical world and from the inner portions of the self. It is not a closed system then. To be human necessitates fine discrimination in the use of such consciousness. Many people are afraid of their own thoughts. They do not examine them. They accept the beliefs of others. Such actions distort data from both within and without. There is no battle between the intuitive self and the conscious mind. There only seems to be when the individual refuses to face all the information that is available in his conscious mind. Pause. Sometimes it seems easier to avoid the frequent readjustments in behavior that self-examination requires. In such cases, an individual collects many second-hand beliefs. Some contradict each other. The signals given to the body and to the inner self are not smoothly flowing or clear-cut, but a muddied jumble of counter-directions. These will immediately set off alarms of various natures. The body will not function properly or the overall emotional environment will suffer. Such reactions are actually excellent precautions, meant to be taken as a sign that change is needed. At the same time, the inner self will transmit to the conscious mind insights and intuitions meant to clear its sight. But if you believe that the inner self is dangerous and not to be trusted, if you are afraid of dreams or any intrusive psychic material, then you deny this help and turn aside from it. If you believe, moreover, that you must accept your difficulties, then this belief alone can deter you from solving them. I repeat, your ideas and beliefs form the structure of your experience. Your beliefs and the reasons for them can be found in your conscious mind. If you accept the idea that the reasons for your behavior are forever buried in the past of this life or any other, then you will not be able to alter your experience until you change that belief. I am speaking now of more or less normal experience. Later, we will discuss more particular areas, such as circumstances in which illnesses date from birth. The realization that you form your own reality should be a liberating one. You are responsible for your successes and your joys. You can change those areas of your life with which you are less than pleased, but you must take the responsibility for your being. Your spirit joined itself with flesh and in flesh to experience a world of incredible richness to help create a dimension of reality of colors and of form. Your spirit was born in flesh to enrich a marvelous area of sense awareness, to feel energy made into corporeal form. You are here to use, enjoy and express yourself through the body. You are here to aid in the great expansion of consciousness. You are not here to cry about the miseries of the human condition, 
but to change them when you find them not to your liking through the joy, strength and vitality that is within you. To create the spirit as faithfully and beautifully as you can in flesh. The conscious mind allows you to look outward into the physical universe and see the reflection of your spiritual activity to perceive and assess your individual and joint creations. In a manner of speaking, the conscious mind is a window through which you look outward and looking outward perceive the fruits of your inner mind. Often you let false beliefs blur the great vision. Your joy Vitality and accomplishment do not come from the outside to you as the result of events that happen to you. They spring from inner events that are the result of your beliefs. Much has been written about the nature and importance of suggestion. One of the current ideas in vogue holds that you are constantly at the mercy of suggestion. Your own conscious beliefs are the most important suggestions that you receive. All other ideas are rejected or accepted according to whether or not you believe they are true, in line with the steady conscious chattering that goes on within your mind most of the day, the suggestions given to you by yourself. You will accept a suggestion given by another only if it fits in with your own ideas about the nature of reality in general and your concepts about yourself in particular. If you use your conscious mind properly, then you examine those beliefs that come to you. You do not accept them willy, nilly. If you use your conscious mind properly, you are also aware of intuitive ideas that come to you from within. You are only half conscious when you do not examine the information that comes to you from without, and when Vu ignore the data that comes to you from within. Many false beliefs, therefore, are indiscriminately accepted because you have not examined them. You have given the inner self a faulty picture of reality. Since it is the function of the conscious mind to assess physical experience, it is the inner self hasn't been able to do its job properly. If the inner portions of the self were supposed to have that responsibility, then you would not need a conscious mind, emphatically. When the inner self is alerted, it will immediately try to remedy the situation by an influx of self-corrective measures. On occasion, when the situation gets out of hand, it will bypass those restrictive areas of the conscious mind and solve the problem by shooting forth energy in other layers of activity. It will manage to work around the blind spots in the reasoning mind, for example. Often it will sift out from the barrage of conflicting beliefs the particular set that is the most life-giving and send these forth in what then appears as a burst of revelation. Such revelations result in new patterns that change behaviour. You must be aware of the contents of your own reasoning mind. Find the ambiguities. Regardless of the nature of your beliefs, they are indeed made flesh and material. The miracle of your being cannot escape itself. Your thoughts blossom into events. If you think the world is evil, you will meet with events that seem evil. There are no accidents in cosmic terms or in terms of the world as you know it. Your beliefs grow as surely in time and space as flowers do. When you realize this, you can even feel their growing. You may take a break. Now... Resume dictation. The conscious mind is basically curious. Open. It is also equipped to examine its own contents. Because of the psychological theories of the last century, many Western people believed that the primary purpose of the conscious mind was to inhibit unconscious material. Instead, as mentioned in this session, it is also meant to receive and interpret important data that comes to it from the inner self. Left alone, it does this very well. It receives and interprets impressions. What has happened, however, is that man has taught it to accept her only data coming from the outside world and to set up barrier against inner knowledge. Such a situation denies the individual his full strength and cuts him off, consciously now, from the important sources of his being. These conditions inhibit creative expression in particular and deny the conscious self the continually emerging insights and intuitions otherwise available.
Thought and feeling then seem separate. Creativity and intellect do not show themselves as the brothers that they are, but often as strangers. The conscious mind loses its fine edge. It cuts out from its experience the vast body of inner knowledge available to it. Divisions, illusionary ones, appear in the self. Left alone, the self acts spontaneously as a unit, but as an ever-changing one. Listening to voices both within and without, the conscious mind is able to form beliefs that are in league with the self's knowledge as received from material and non-material sources. Then examination of beliefs takes its place along with other activities, naturally, easily, without effort. Once the conscious mind has accepted a collection of conflicting beliefs, however, a definite attempt is necessary to sort these out. Remember, even false beliefs will seem to be justified in terms of physical data, since your experience in the outside world is the materialization of those beliefs. So you must work with the raw material of your ideas. Even while your sense data may tell you that a given belief fifteen obviously a truth to change your experience or any portion of it, then you must change your ideas. Since you have been forming your own reality all along, the results will follow naturally. Pause. You must be convinced that you can alter your beliefs. You must be willing to try. Think of a limiting idea as a muddy color, and our life as a multi-dimensional painting that is marred. You change the idea as an artist would his palette. The artist does not identify with the colors he uses. He knows he chooses them and applies them with a brush. So you paint your reality with your ideas in the same manner. You are not your ideas, nor even your thoughts. You are the self who experiences them. If a painter finds his hands stained with pigment at the end of a day, he can wash the stain off easily, knowing its nature. If you think that limiting thoughts are a portion of you, permanently attached, therefore, you will not think of washing them off. You would behave instead like a mad artist who says, "My paints are a part of me. They have stained my fingers, and there is nothing I can do about it." There is no contradiction. Though there may seem to be between spontaneously being aware of your thoughts and examining them, you do not have to be blind to be spontaneous. You are not being spontaneous when you indiscriminately accept as your own, for a fact, every bit of data that comes to you. Many beliefs would automatically fall away quite harmlessly if you were being truly spontaneous. Instead, you often harbour them. With previous limiting ideas, accepted figuratively form a restraining bed, gathering other such material, so that your mind becomes filled with debris. When you are spontaneous, you accept the free nature of your mind, and it spontaneously makes decisions as to the validity or non-validity or non-validity of data it receives. When you refuse to allow it this function, it becomes cluttered. No apple tree tries to grow violets. Quite automatically, it knows what it is and the framework of its own identity and existence. Pause. You have a conscious mind, but this is only the topmost portion of your mind. Much more of it is available to you. Much more of your knowledge can be conscious, therefore. But a false belief, a limiting one, is as ambiguous to your nature as any apple tree's idea that it was a violet plant. It could not produce violets, nor could it be a good apple tree while it tried to. The mistaken belief is one that does not fit the basic conditions of your inner being. So, if you believe that you are at the mercy of physical events, you entertain a false belief. If you feel that your present experience was set in circumstances beyond your control, you entertain a false belief. You had a hand in the development of your childhood environment. You chose the circumstances. This does not mean that you are at the mercy of those circumstances. It means that you set challenges to be overcome, set goals to be reached, set up frameworks of experience through which you could develop, understand, and fulfil certain abilities. 
The creative power to form your own experience is within you now, as it has been since the time of your birth and before. You may have chosen a particular theme for this existence, a certain framework of conditions, but within these you have the freedom to experiment, create and alter conditions and events. Each person chooses for himself the individual patterns within which he will create this personal reality. But inside these bounds are infinite varieties of actions and unlimited resources. The inner self is embarked upon an exciting endeavour in which it learns how to translate its reality into physical terms. The conscious mind is brilliantly attuned to physical reality then, and often so dazzled by what it perceives that it is tempted to think physical phenomena is a cause rather than a result. Deeper portions of the self always serve to remind it that this is not the case. When the conscious mind accepts too many false beliefs, particularly if it sees that inner self as a danger, then it closes out these constant reminders. When this situation arises, the conscious mind feels itself assailed by a reality that seems greater than itself, over which it has no control. The deep feeling of security in which it should be anchored is lost. The false beliefs must be weeded out so that the conscious mind can become aware of its source once again and open to the inner channels of splendor and power available to it. The ego is an offshoot of the conscious mind, so to speak. The conscious mind is like a gigantic camera with the ego directing the view and the focus. Left alone, various portions of the identity rise and form, the ego degroup and reform, all the while maintaining a marvellous spontaneity and yet a sense of oneness. See both sessions in Chapter 1. The ego is your idea of your physical image in relation to the world. Your self-image is not unconscious then. You are quite aware of it, though often you reject certain thoughts about it in favour of others. False beliefs can result in a rigid ego that insists upon using the conscious mind in one direction only, further distorting its perceptions. Often you quite consciously decide to bury a thought or an idea that might cause you to alter your behaviour because it does not seem to fit in with limiting ideas that you already hold. Listen to your own train of thought as you go about your days. What suggestions and ideas are Vu giving yourself? Realise that these will be materialised in your personal experience. Many quite limiting ideas will pass without scrutiny under the guise of goodness. You may feel quite virtuous, for example, in hating evil or what seems to you to be evil. But if you find yourself concentrating upon either hatred or evil, you are creating it. If you are poor, you may feel quite self-righteous in your financial condition, looking with scorn upon those who are wealthy telling yourself that money is wrong and so reinforcing the condition of poverty. If you are ill, you may find yourself dwelling upon the misery of your condition and bitterly envying those who are healthy, bemoaning your state and therefore perpetuating it through your thoughts. If you dwell upon limitations, then you will meet them. You must create a new picture in your mind. It will differ from the picture your physical senses may show you at any given time, precisely in those areas where changes are required. Hatred of war will not bring peace. Another example. Only love of peace will bring about those conditions. You may take a break or end the session as you prefer. Now, we will resume dictation. I quite realise that many of my statements will contradict the beliefs of those of you who accept the idea that the conscious mind is relatively powerless and that the answers to problems lie hidden beneath. Obviously, the conscious mind is a phenomenon, not a thing. It is ever-changing. It can be concentrated or turned by the ego in literally endless directions. It can view outward reality or turn inward, observing its own contents. There are gradations and fluctuations within its activity. It is far more flexible than you give it credit for. Pause. 
The ego can use the conscious mind almost entirely as a way of perceiving external or internal realities that coincide with its own beliefs. It is not that certain answers do not lie openly accessible, therefore, but that often you have set yourself on a course of action in which you believe and you do not want to open yourself to any material that may contradict your current beliefs. If you are sick, for example, there is a reason. To recover thoroughly without taking on new symptoms, you must discover the reason. You may dislike your illness, but it is a course you have decided upon. While you are convinced that the course is necessary, you will keep the symptoms. Now, these may be the result of one specific belief or caused by a complex of beliefs held together. The beliefs, of course, will be accepted by you not as beliefs, but as reality. Once you understand that you form your reality, then you must begin to examine these beliefs by letting the conscious mind freely examine its own contents. We will speak about health and illness more specifically later in the book. I would like to make one point here, however, that often psychoanalysis is simply a game of hide-and-seek in which you continue to relinquish responsibility for your actions and reality and assign the basic cause to some area of the psyche hidden in a dark forest of the past. Then you give yourself the task of finding this secret. In so doing, you never think of looking for it in the conscious mind, since you are convinced that all deep answers lie far beneath, and, moreover, that your consciousness is not only unable to help you, but will often send up camouflages instead. So you play that game. When and if you manage to change your beliefs in that self-deceptive framework, then any suitable forgotten event from the past will be used as a catalyst. One would do as well as another. The basic beliefs, however, were always in your conscious mind and the reasons for your behavior. You simply had not examined its contents with the realization that your beliefs were not necessarily reality, but often your conceptions of it. At the same time, in psychoanalysis, you are often programmed to believe that the unconscious, being the source of such dark secrets, cannot be counted upon as any bed of creativity or inspiration, and so you are denied the help that the inner portions of the self could give O33 to your consciousness, 950. Usually when you do examine your conscious mind, you do so looking through or with your own structured beliefs. The knowledge that your beliefs are not necessarily reality will allow you to be aware of all the data that is consciously available to you. I am not telling you to examine your thoughts so frequently and with such vigour that you get in your own way, but you are not fully conscious unless you are aware of the contents of your conscious mind. I am also emphasising the fact that the conscious mind is equipped to receive information from the inner self as well as the exterior universe. I am not telling you to inhibit thoughts or feelings. I am asking that you become aware of those you have, realise that they form your reality. Concentrate on those that give you the results that you want. If you find all of this difficult, you can also examine your physical, you can also examine your physical reality in all of its aspects. Realise that your physical experience and environment is the materialization of your beliefs. If you find great exuberance, health, effective work, abundance, smiles on the faces of those you meet, then take it for granted that your beliefs are beneficial. If you see a world that is good, people that like you take it for granted, again, that your beliefs are beneficial. But if you find poor health, a lack of meaningful work, a lack of abundance, a world of sorrow and evil, then assume that your beliefs are faulty and begin examining them. We will later discuss the nature of mass reality, but for now we are dwelling upon the personal aspects. The main point I wanted to make in this chapter was that your conscious beliefs are extremely important and that you are not at the mercy of events or causes that dwell far beneath your awareness. Chapter 3. Suggestion, Telepathy and the Grouping of Beliefs 
Chapter 3 Ideas have an electromagnetic reality. Beliefs are strong ideas about the nature of reality. Ideas generate emotion, like attracts like, so similar ideas group about each other, and you accept those that fit in with your particular system of ideas. The ego attempts to maintain a clear point of focus, of stability, so that it can direct the light of the conscious mind with some precision and concentrate its focus in areas of actuality that seem permanent. As mentioned in Chapter 1, the ego, while a portion of the whole self, can be defined as a psychological structure composed of characteristics belonging to the personality as a whole, organized together to form a surface identity. Now, generally speaking, through the period of a lifetime, this allows for the easy emergence of many tendencies and abilities. It permits many more potentials to emerge than would otherwise be possible. If this were not the case, for example, your interests throughout life would not change. E37AUS, the ego, while appearing to be permanent, then forever changes as it adapts to new characteristics from the whole self and lets others recede, otherwise it would not be responsive to the needs and desires of the entire personality. Because it is intimately connected with other portions of the self, it does not basically feel alienated or alone, but proudly acts as the director of the conscious mind's focus. It is an adjunct of the conscious mind in that respect. Basically, it understands its source and its nature. It is the portion of the mind, then, that looks out upon physical reality and surveys it in relation to those characteristics of which it is composed at any given time. It makes its judgments according to its own idea of itself. It is the most physically oriented portion of your inner self. But it is not, however, apart from your inner self. It sits on the window sill, so to speak, between you and the exterior world. Voice stronger for emphasis. It can also look in both directions. It makes judgments about the nature of reality in relationship to its and your needs. It accepts or does not accept beliefs. It cannot shut out information from your conscious mind, however, but it can refuse to pay attention to it. This does not mean that the information becomes unconscious. It is simply thrown into a corner of your mind, unassimilated and not organized into the parcel of beliefs upon which you are presently concentrating. It is there if you look for it. It is not invisible, nor do you have to know exactly what you are looking for, which of course would make the situation nearly impossible. All you have to do is decide to examine the contents of your conscious mind, realizing that it contains treasures that you have overlooked. Another way to do this is to recognize through examination that the physical effects you meet exist as data in your conscious mind and the information that formerly seemed unavailable will be obvious. The seemingly invisible ideas that cause your difficulties have quite obvious visible physical effects and these will lead you automatically to the conscious area in which the initiating beliefs or ideas reside. Once more, if you become aware of your own conscious thoughts, these themselves will give you clues for they clearly speak your beliefs. If, for example, you have scarcely enough money on which to live and you examine your thoughts, you may find yourself constantly thinking, I can never pay this bill, I never have any luck, I'll always be poor. Or you will find yourself envying those who have more, degrading the value of money perhaps, and saying that those who have it are unhappy or at best spiritually poor. When you find these thoughts in yourself, you may say, and rather indignantly, but those things are all true. I am poor. I cannot meet my bills and so forth. In so doing, you see, you accept your belief about reality as a characteristic of reality itself, and so the belief is transparent or invisible to you, but it causes your physical experience. You must change the belief. I will give you methods to allow you to do this. You may follow your thoughts in another area, 
and find yourself thinking that you are having difficulty because you are too sensitive. Finding the thought you may say, but it is true, I am. I react with such great emotion to small things. But that is a belief and a limiting one. If you follow your thoughts further, you may find yourself thinking, I am proud of my sensitivity. It sets me apart from the mob or I am too good for this world. These are limiting beliefs. They will distort true reality, your own true reality. These are but a few samples of the ways in which your own quite conscious ideas may be invisible to you while being available all the time. Limiting your experience. Now we have been speaking of the conscious mind, for it is the director of your activities physically. I told you at the beginning of this chapter that it was important to realize the ego's position as the most exterior portion of the inner self, not alienated, but looking outward to physical reality. Using this analogy, portions of the self on the other side of the conscious mind constantly receive telepathic data. Remember, there are no divisions, so the terms used are simply to make the discussion easier. The ego tries to organize all material coming into the conscious mind for its purposes. The egos are those that have come to the surface at any given time in the self's overall encounter with physical reality. As I said, the ego cannot keep information out of the conscious mind, but it can refuse to focus directly upon it. Now, the telepathic information, using our analogy, comes through deeper portions of the self. These parts have such an amazing capacity to receive that some organization is necessary to sift the data. Some is simply not important to you. It concerns people of whom you have no other knowledge. You are a sender and a receiver because ideas have an electromagnetic reality beliefs because of their intensity radiate strongly due to the organizing structure of your own psychological nature similar beliefs congregate and you will readily accept those with which you already agree limiting ideas therefore predispose you to accept others of a similar nature exuberant ideas of freedom spontaneity and joy automatically collect others of their kind also there is a constant interplay between yourself and others in the exchange of ideas, both telepathically and on a conscious level. This interchange follows, again, your conscious beliefs. It is fashionable in some circles to believe that you react physically to telepathically received messages despite your conscious beliefs or ideas. This is not the case. You react only to those telepathic messages that fit in with your conscious ideas about yourself and your reality emphatically. Let me add that the conscious mind is itself spontaneous. It enjoys playing with its own contents, so I am not here recommending a type of stern mental discipline in which you examine yourself at every moment. I am telling you about countering measures that you can take in areas in which you are not pleased with your experience. You will react, therefore, to all the information that you receive according to your conscious beliefs concerning the nature of reality. The deeper portions of the self do not have to take the ego's idea of time into consideration, so these portions of the self also deal with data that would ordinarily escape the ego's perception, perhaps until a certain point of ego time was reached. The ego, which must manipulate most directly with the everyday world, takes time, clock time, quite seriously. Even the ego, however, realizes to some extent that clock time is a convention, but it does not like such conventions broken. It will often neglect any clairvoyant or precognitive material that comes into the conscious mind from the deeper portions of the self. On occasion, when the ego recognizes that such data can be highly practical, it then becomes more liberal in its recognition of it, but only when such information fits in with its concepts of what is possible and not possible. Now the ego's concepts are your concepts, since it is a part of you. 
If you dwell on ideas of danger or potential disaster, if you think of the world mainly in terms of your physical survival and consider all those circumstances that may work against it, then you may find yourself suddenly aware of precognitive dreams that foretell incidents of accidents, earthquakes, robberies or murders. Your own idea of the perilous nature of existence becomes so strong that the ego allows this data to emerge, even though it is out of time, because your fearful beliefs convince it that you must be on guard. The incidents do not even have to involve you. From all the unconscious, telepathic and clairvoyant data available, however, you will be aware of this particular grouping, and it will only serve to reinforce your idea that existence is above all perilous. If this information becomes available in the dream state, you may then say, I am frightened of dreams. My bad dreams so often come true, so you try to inhibit memory of your dreams. Instead, you should examine your conscious beliefs, for they are so strong that they are causing you not only to focus upon calamity in the physical world, but to use your inner abilities to the same end. Telepathic communication is constant. This is usually at an unconscious level, merely because your conscious mind is in a state of becoming. It cannot hold all of the information you possess. As an example, if your conscious ideas are relatively positive, you will react to telepathically received information of a similar nature, even if you do so on an unconscious level. As I mentioned earlier in the 616th session, you are also sending your own telepathic thoughts outward. Others will react to those according to their own ideas of reality. A family can constantly reinforce its joy, louder, gaiety and spontaneity by concentrating on ideas of vitality, strength and creativity. Or it can let half of its energy slip away, deeper, by reinforcing resentments, angers, and thoughts of doubt and failure. I get it. Seth's clever, somewhat humorous stresses in the above paragraph were intended to make certain points to me personally while he continued work on his book. Involved were discussions between Jane and me today, and some poor perceptions on my part. Either way, the ideas of reality are reinforced both consciously and unconsciously, not only within the family, but among all those with whom the family comes in contact. You get what you concentrate upon. There is no other main rule. It may be easy for you to see beliefs that are invisible to others in themselves. Reading this book, you may be able to point at friends or acquaintances and see clearly that their ideas are invisible beliefs which limit their experience, and yet be blind to your own invisible beliefs which you take so readily as truth or characteristics of reality. Your sense data, again, will most definitely reinforce your ideas. You will also react clairvoyantly and telepathically to inner information at an unconscious level that is once more collected. Under the organization of your quite conscious concepts concerning existence in general and your own in particular, so you are locked into physical situations that are corroborated by the great evidence of sense data, and of course it is convincing because it reflects so beautifully, so creatively, so creatively, and so actively your own ideas and beliefs, whether they are positive or negative. In greater terms, positive and negative have little meaning, for the physical experience is meant as a learning one. But if you are unhappy then the word negative has a meaning of some invisible ones that had been accepted before as definite aspects of reality. Now, if you are honest with your lists, you will finally come to what I call core beliefs, strong ideas about your own existence. Many other subsidiary beliefs that earlier seemed separate from each other should now appear quite clearly as being offshots of core beliefs. They seem logical only in their relationship to a core idea. Once the core belief is understood to be a false one, the others will fall away. It is the core belief which is strong enough to so focus your perception 
that you perceive from the physical world, only those events that correlate with it. It is also the strength of the core belief that draws up from the vast bank of inner knowledge only those events that seem to fit within its organization. Now let me give you a brief example of a core belief. It is a blanket belief. Human nature is inherently evil. This is a core belief. About it will spring events that only serve to reinforce it. Experiences, both personal and global, will come into the perception of a person who holds this belief that will only serve to deepen it further. From all the available physical data of newspapers, television, letters and private communication, he or she will concentrate only upon those issues that prove that point. Suspicion of others will grow to say nothing about the individual's personal distrust. The belief will reach into the most intimate areas of his or her life and finally, no evidence will seem to be available to disprove it. This is a sample of an invisible core belief at its worst. A person holding it will not trust a mate, family, friends, colleagues, country or the world in general. Another more personal core belief. My life is worthless. What I do is meaningless. Now, a person who holds such an idea will ordinarily not recognize it as an invisible belief. Instead, he or she may emotionally feel that life has no meaning, that individual action is meaningless, that death is annihilation, and connected to this will be a conglomeration of subsidiary beliefs that deeply affect the family involved and all those with whom such a person comes in contact. In writing down your list of personal beliefs, therefore, leave nothing out. Examine the list as though it belonged to someone else. I did not want to imply that you make a list of specifically negative ideas, however. It is of supreme importance that you recognize the existence of joyful beliefs and take into consideration those elements of your own experience with which you have had success. I want you to capture that feeling of accomplishment and to translate it or transfer it to areas in which you have had difficulty. But you must remember that the ideas exist first and the experience physically follows. You may take your break. You make your own reality. I cannot say this too often. There will be periods where all of your beliefs are at an even par, so to speak. They will agree. The ideas may be quite limited. They may be false. They may be based upon premises that are not true. Their vitality and strength, however, will be quite real and seem to bring excellent results. Wealth is everything. Now this idea is far from a truth. The person who accepts it completely, though, will be wealthy and in excellent health, and everything will fit in quite well with his beliefs. Yet the idea is still a belief about reality, and so there will be invisible gulfs in his experience, of which he is ignorant. On the outside, the situation will look most advantageous, and while the person seems quite content, beneath there will be the gnawing knowledge of incompletion. On the surface, there will be balance. So as your beliefs change, there will be alterations in your experience and behavior and points of stress, creative stress, while you are learning. Our rich man just mentioned may suddenly realize that his belief is limiting in that he concentrated upon it exclusively so that money and health became his sole aims. The shattered belief may leave him open to illness, which would seem like a negative experience. Yet through the illness, he may be led to areas of perception he had earlier denied and when you may be enriched in that particular manner. The shifting of belief may then open him to question his other beliefs, and he realizes that in the area of wealth, for example, he did very well because of his beliefs. But in those others, perhaps deeper experiences opened by his illness, he learns that human experience includes dimensions of reality that had earlier been closed to him, and that these are also easily within his reach, and without the illness that originally brought them forth, a new conglomeration of beliefs might emerge. In the meantime, there was stress, but it was creative. Now here is another example. 
Your conscious thoughts regulate your health. The persistent idea of illness will make you ill. While you believe that you become ill because of viruses, infections, or accidents, then you must go to doctors who operate within that system of belief. And because you believe in their cures, hopefully you will be relieved of your difficulty. Because you do not understand that your thoughts create illness, you will continue to undergo it. However, and new symptoms will appear. You will again return to the doctor. When you are in the process of changing beliefs, when you are beginning to realize that your thoughts and feelings cause illness, then for a while you may not know what to do. In the larger context, you realize that the doctor can at best give you temporary relief, yet you may not be completely convinced as yet of your own ability to change your thoughts, or you may be so cowed by their effectiveness that you are frightened. So there is a period of stress in between beliefs, so to speak, while you dispense with one set and are learning to use another. But here you become involved with one of the most meaningful aspects of the nature of personal reality as you test your thoughts against what seems to be. There may be a time before you learn how to change your thoughts effectively, but you are engaged in a basic meaningful endeavor. The truth is then that you form your reality directly. You react consciously and unconsciously to your beliefs. You collect from the physical universe and the interior one data that seems to correlate with your beliefs. Believe then that you are a being unlimited by nature, born into flesh to materialize as best you can the great joy and spontaneity of your nature. Core beliefs are those about which you build your life you are consciously aware of these, though often you do not focus your attention upon them. They become invisible, therefore, unless you become aware of the contents of your conscious mind. To become acquainted with your own ideas and beliefs, you must walk among them, symbolically speaking, without blinders. You must look through the structures that you have yourself created, the organized ideas upon which you have grouped your experience. To see clearly into your own mind, you must first of all unstructure your thoughts, follow them without judging them, without comparing them to the framework of your beliefs. Structured beliefs collect and hold your experience, packaging it so to speak. And so when you look at a given experience that seems like another, you put it into the same structured package, often without examination. Such beliefs can hold surprises. When you lift up the cover of one, you may find that it has served to hide valuable information that did not belong there. An artificial grouping of ideas, like paper flower, can be collected about a standard core belief. The core belief, because of its intensity and because of your habits, will often tend to attract to itself others of a like nature. They will hang on. If you are not accustomed to examining your own mind, then you can allow separate growths of this kind to form about a belief until you cannot distinguish one from the other. This can develop to such an extent that all of your experience is seen only in relationship to this idea, growth. Seth called for the hyphen. Data that seems unrelated to this core belief is then not assimilated, but thrown into the corners of your mind, unused, and you are denied the value of the information. Separate portions of your mind can contain such chambers of inactive material. This information will not be a part of the organized structure of your usual thoughts. Though the data is consciously available, you can be relatively blind to it. Usually when you look into your conscious mind, you do so for a particular reason, to find some information. But if you have schooled yourself to believe that such data is not consciously available, then it will not occur to you to find it in your conscious mind. If furthermore your conscious data is strongly organized about a core belief, then this will automatically make you blind to experience that is not connected with it. A core belief is invisible only when you think of it as a fact of life and not as a belief about life. Only when you identify with it so completely that you automatically focus your perceptions along that specific line. For example, 
Here is a seemingly very innocent core belief. I am a responsible parent. Now, on the surface, there is nothing wrong with that belief. If you hold to it and do not examine it, however, you may find that the word responsible is quite loaded and collects other ideas that are equally unexamined by you. What is your idea of being responsible? According to your answer, you can discover whether the core belief works to your advantage or not. If responsible means I must be a parent 24 hours a day to the exclusion of everything else, then you may be in difficulty, for that core belief might prevent you from using other abilities that exist quite apart from your parenthood. You may begin to perceive all physical data through the eyes of that core belief alone. You will not look out upon physical reality with the wonder of a child any more, or with the unstructured curiosity of an IT50 individual, but always through parental eyes. Thus, you will close yourself off from much of physical experience. Now, telepathically, you will also attract unconscious data that fits into this rigid pattern, according to the strength and stubbornness of this idea and whether or not you are willing to deal with it. You may narrow our life still further, all information of any kind finally becoming relatively invisible to you unless it touches upon your parental reality. Now, the core belief just given is of one kind. You hold some basic assumptions that are also core beliefs. To you, they seem to be definitions. They are so a part of you that you take them for granted. Your idea of time is one. You may enjoy manipulating thoughts of time in your mind. You may find yourself thinking that time is basically different from your experience of it, but fundamentally you believe that you exist in the hours and the years, that the weeks come at you one at a time, that you are caught in the onrush of the seasons. Naturally, your physical experience reinforces this belief. You structure your perception, therefore, in terms of the lapses that seem to happen between events. This in itself forces you to concentrate your attention in one direction only and discourages you from perceiving the events in your life in other fashions. You may occasionally employ the association of ideas, one thought leading easily to another. When you do this, you often perceive new insights. As the events fall apart from time continuity in your mind, they seem to take on fresh vitality. You have unstructured them, you see, from the usual organization. As you apprehend them through association, you come quite close to examining the contents of your mind in a free fashion. But if you drop the time concept and then view the conscious content of your mind through other core ideas, you are still structuring. I am not saying that you should never organize those contents. I am saying that you must become aware of your own structures. Build them up or tear them down, but do not allow yourself to become blind to the furniture of your own mind. You can stub your toe as easily on a misplaced idea as you can upon an old chair. It will help you, in fact, if you think of your own beliefs as furniture that can be rearranged, changed, renewed, completely discarded or replaced. Your ideas are yours. They should not control you. It is up to you to accept those that you choose to accept. Imagine yourself then rearranging this furniture. Images of particular pieces will come clearly to you. Ask yourself what ideas these pieces represent. See how well the tables fit together. Open up the drawers inside. There will be no mystery. You know what your own beliefs are. You will see the groupings, but it is up to you to look inside your own mind and to use the images in your own way. Throw out ideas that do not suit you. If you read this, find such an idea in yourself and then say, one cannot throw this idea away, then you must realize that your inner remark is in itself a belief. You can indeed throw the idea away, the second one, as easily as the first, you are not powerless before ideas. Using this analogy, you will certainly find some furniture that you did not expect. Do not simply look in the center of your inner room of consciousness. 
and make sure that you are on guard against the certain invisibility that was mentioned earlier in this chapter, where an idea quite available appears to be a part of reality instead. The structuring of beliefs is done in a highly characteristic yet individual manner, so you will find patterns that exist between various groupings and one can lead you to another. The idea of being the responsible parent, for example, may lead quite easily to other psychic structures involving responsibility so that data is accepted on its own value. You may even think that it is wrong to view any situation except through your parental status. The belief in guilt, therefore, would be a cementing structure that would hold together other similar core beliefs and add to their strength. You must understand that these are not simply dead ideas, like debris, within your mind. They are psychic matter. In a sense, then they are alive. They group themselves like cells, protecting their own validity and identity. You feed them, figuratively speaking, with like ideas. When you examine one such belief, then you obviously threaten the integrity of the structure. And so there are ways of inserting new supports. So to methods to tide you over, the whole core belief need not fall down upon you as you examine its basis. Imagination also plays an important part in your subjective life as it gives mobility to your beliefs. It is one of the motivating agencies that helps transform your beliefs into physical experience. It is vital, therefore, that you understand the interrelationship between ideas and imagination. In order to dislodge unsuitable beliefs and establish new ones, you must learn to use your imagination to move concepts in and out of your mind. The proper use of imagination can then propel ideas in the directions you desire. Chapter 4. Your Imagination and Your Beliefs and a Few Words About the Origin of Your Beliefs In physical life, your conscious mind is largely dependent upon the workings of your physical brain. You have a conscious mind whether you are in flesh or out of it, but when you are physically oriented, then it is connected to the physical brain. The brain, to some extent, keeps the mind to a three-dimensional focus. It orients you toward the environment in which you must operate, and it is because of the mind's allegiance with the temporal brain that you perceive, for example, time as a series of moments. The brain channels the information that the mind receives to your physical structure so that your experience is physically sifted and automatically translated into terms that the organism can understand. Because of this, physically speaking and in life as you think of it, the mind is to a large extent dependent on the brain's growth and activity. There is some information necessary to physical survival that must be taught and handed down from parent to child. There are basic assumptions of a general nature with which you are born, but because the specific conditions of your environment are so various, these must be implemented. So it is necessary that the child accept beliefs from its parents. These will reinforce the family group when the child most needs protection. This acquiescence to belief then is important in the early stages as infant develops into child. This sharing of mutual ideas not only protects the new offspring from dangers obvious to the parents, it also serves as a framework within which the child can grow. This provides leeway until the conscious mind is able to reason for itself and provide its own value judgments. Later, I will discuss greater aspects of the origin of ideas, but for now we will simply speak in terms of this life, the one you know. The beliefs that you receive, therefore, are your parents' conceptions of the nature of reality. They are given to you through example, verbal communication and constant telepathic reinforcement. You receive ideas about the world in general and your relationship to it, and from your parents you are also given concepts of what you are. You pick up their ideas of your own reality. Underneath all of this, you carry indelibly within you your own knowledge of your identity, meaning and purpose. But in the early stages of development, great care is taken to see that you relate 
in physical terms. These are directional beliefs that you receive from your parents, orienting you in ways that they feel are safe. Cushioned with these beliefs, the child can be safe and satisfy its own curiosity, develop its abilities and throw its full energy in clearly stated areas of activity. So it is quite necessary that an acquiescence to belief does exist, particularly in early life. There is no reason, though, for an individual to be bound by childhood beliefs or experience. The nature of some such beliefs is that while seemingly obvious ones are recognized as harmful or foolish, others connected to them may not be so easily understood. For example, it may seem silly to you that you ever believed in, say, original sin. It may not be so obvious that many of your present actions are caused by a belief in guilt. We will have much to say about the ways in which your beliefs can be connected simply because you are not used to examining them. You may say, I am overweight because I feel guilty about something in my past. You may then try to discover what the charged event was. But in such a case, your trouble is a belief in guilt itself. You do not have to carry such a belief. I am well aware that strong elements of your civilization are built upon ideas of guilt and punishment. Many of you are afraid that without a feeling of guilt, there would be no inner discipline and the world would run wild. It is running quite wild now, not despite your ideas of guilt and punishment, but largely because of them but we will have more to say about that later in the book. The early ideas given to you by your parents, then, structure your learning experiences themselves. They set the safe boundaries within which you can operate in early years, quite without your conscious knowing, because your mind, connected with its brain, is not that developed. Your imagination is set along certain roads, Largely, but not completely, your imagination follows your beliefs, as do your emotions. To some extent, there are certain general patterns. A child will cry when it is hurt. It will stop when the hurt stops, and the emotion behind the cry will automatically change into another. But if the child discovers that a prolonged cry after the event gets extra attention and consideration, then it will begin to extend the emotion. From the earliest stages, the child automatically compares its interpretation of reality with its parents. Since the parents are bigger and stronger and fulfill so many of its needs, it will attempt to bring its experience into line with their expectations and beliefs. While it is generally quite natural for the child to cry or feel badly when hurt, this inclination can be carried through belief to such an extent that prolonged feelings of desolation are adopted as definite behavior patterns. Behind this would be the belief that any hurt was inherently a disaster. Such a belief could originate from an overanxious mother, for instance. If such a mother's imagination followed her belief, as of course it would, then she would immediately perceive a great potential danger to her child in the smallest threat. Both through the mother's actions and telepathically, the child would receive such a message and react according to those understood beliefs. Many such beliefs lie quite within the conscious mind. The grown adult, not used to examining his or her own beliefs, however, may be quite unaware of harboring such an idea. The idea itself is not buried or unconscious. It is simply unexamined. So one of the most hampering beliefs of all as earlier mentioned in the 614th session, in Chapter 2, for instance, is the idea that the clues to current behaviour are buried and usually inaccessible. This belief itself closes to you the contents of your own conscious mind and prevents you from looking there for the answers that are available. First of all, it is within your conscious mind the pendulum would be a method of allowing you to view conscious material that is not structured to recognize beliefs. I want you to understand that, for the reader does not have the benefit of my talking to him personally in this way, the belief is conscious. You are well aware of it, but you are not aware of those that cling to it. The belief is that you do not communicate well with your mother. Seth was quite correct. 
Talk about seeing the proverbial light. Suddenly, I saw the belief that had been right there all the time. Remember that Jane and I had spent the weekend visiting my mother and brother at Al. Hinged to this is the belief that this felt lack of communication is wrong, and that for anything wrong you should be punished. In taking dictation for this book, you are helping us communicate with many people, while at the same time you feel that you cannot communicate with your own parent. These beliefs working together then bring about a strain in the hand. That does the writing. Quite simply, you want to express through the sessions these ideas in which you so believe, and yet you feel or believe yourself guilty for doing so when you cannot describe the same ideas to your own parent. The conflicting beliefs then cause the difficulty in the method. The hands motion is not as automatically smooth as it should be. You also believe that you communicate through writing far better than you do verbally. To Rubert, you often write notes saying things easily and beautifully that you find difficult verbally because of your belief. Yes, I. So this evening you feel guilty in reaching others through transcribing the notes when you believe that you could not reach your mother vocally. So the method becomes involved with your beliefs. With a smile. I am giving this to you to show you how beliefs work. I need the help too. You also believe. You also believe humorously. If you wish, you can underline every believe. While I am talking to you, that your main method of communication is painting, and here you are taking notes as a form of dissemination instead. This would not be involved, particularly were it not for the fact of two subsidiary current beliefs that conflict, having to do with the weekend. One that you should be in Rochester, as you were dealing vocally with your mother, and two that you should have been here, reaching out to the world at large through your painting. Instead, on your return, you are communicating to the world through your notes, a choice you made consciously. But without being aware of the other contents of your conscious mind and the conflicting beliefs, do you follow me? Yes. These mentioned beliefs are obvious enough when I tell you of them, but their opposing natures gave confusing data to the body consciousness. Write and do not write. The idea of punishment, the belief in it, also enters in. You do what you decided to do anyway. Have the session, but. By punishing yourself with your own personal interpretation, your mother's condition, you believe, involves a lack of communication. Your brother told you about her occasionally faltering speech. Now your quite conscious interpretation of an apt kind of self-punishment was a lack of hand motion. I am trying to put this simply so you can follow the connections, because you believe your method of expression is primarily through your hand in painting. And you believe your mother's to be vocal. You tampered with your hand's motion, not, for example, your speech. Can you follow that consciously? Yes. And it was very well put. I thought as I wrote. Now, at various times, you made those conscious choices. They escaped your notice, but they existed as conscious points of awareness and choice. Now, do you have any questions? Ten forty. No, I just like time to think about all of this. Now, Rupert has recently been in the process of recognizing some beliefs that he wants to get rid of. He has been loosening them so that they rattle around within his consciousness. He is becoming aware of them. They are not as invisible as they were. He is facing many of them for the first time. You should both become equally aware and consciously and alertly aware. The beneficial ideas and their importance in your lives, and this will be a portion of the book for others also. Tonight, Rupert was exhausted in one way from comparing your joint beliefs with those of your brother's family, of checking his own body beliefs. Jane touched her knee with theirs and seeing where his were detrimental, but also from contrasting his personal psychic and creative abilities with theirs, and that exhilarated him. The result, smilingly, was that he felt both exhausted and exhilarated. Hmm.
Sixty-one, I saw to it that he became aware that I was working on our book this morning. Ideas about it came into his consciousness. In the past, he did not believe that such bleed-throughs should occur, and so in his experience, they did not usually emerge. They were there, but his belief prevented his recognition of them. I will, from time to time, give subsidiary material for Rupert and also for you. Implementing a chapter in the book for your personal use, it is vital that you realize you are working with beliefs in your mind, that the real work is done there in the mind, and not look for immediate physical results. They will follow as surely and certainly as the bad results followed, and this must be a belief that the good results will come. But the real work is done in the mind. If you do the work, then you can rest assured that the results. But you must not check constantly for them. Do you see the difference? Yes. Do you have any questions? No. I think it's excellent material. As Seth, Jane now did something rather unusual. She turned in her rocker to look at the clock that sits to her left and somewhat behind her on our combination bookcase and room divider. Now take a brief break. I will then add some book material to get us further into the chapter, but I will not keep you over long. Ten fifty-five. After Jane had come out of another far-out trance, as she put it, I was very pleased to tell her that my writing hand was much improved and that Seth had answered her own questions. I went over the delivery with her. Resume at eleven eight. Dictation. Pause. Your beliefs always change to some extent. As an adult, you perform many activities that you believed you could not as a child. For instance, you may, at the age of the age of three, have believed it was dangerous to cross a street. By thirty, hopefully, you have dismissed such a belief, though it fit in very well and was necessary to you in your childhood. If your mother reinforced this belief telepathically and verbally through dire pictures of the potential danger involved in street crossing, however, then you would also carry within you that emotional fear and perhaps entertain imaginative considerations of possible accident. Your emotions and your imagination both follow your belief. When the belief vanishes, then the same emotional context is no longer. Sue sixty-two entertained, and your imagination turns in other direction. Beliefs automatically mobilize your emotional and imaginative powers. Few beliefs are intellectual alone. When you are examining the contents of your conscious mind, you must learn or recognize the emotional and imaginative connotations that are connected with a given idea. There are various ways of altering the belief by substituting its opposite. One particular method is three-pronged. You generate the emotion opposite the one that arises from the belief you want to change, and you turn your imagination in the opposite direction from the one dictated by the belief. At the same time, you consciously assure yourself that the unsatisfactory belief is an idea about reality and not an aspect of reality itself. You realize that ideas are not stationary; emotions and imagination move them in one direction or the other, reinforce them or negate them. Pause at eleven twenty-three. Quite deliberately, you use your conscious mind playfully, creating a game as children do. In which, for a time, you completely ignore what seems to be in physical terms and pretend that what you really want is real. If you are poor, you purposely pretend that you have all you need financially. Imagine how you will spend your money. If you are ill, imagine playfully that you are cured. See yourself doing what you would do. If you cannot communicate with others, imagine yourself doing so easily. If you feel your days dark and pointless, then imagine them filled and joyful. Now this may sound impractical, yet in your daily life you use your imagination and your emotions, often at the service of far less worthy beliefs, and the results are quite clear. And let me add, unfortunately practical, as it took a while for the unsatisfactory beliefs to become materialized, so it may be a time before you see physical results.
but the new ideas will take growth and change your experience as certainly as the old ones did. The process of imagining will also bring you face to face with other subsidiary ideas that may momentarily bring you up short. You may see where you held two quite conflicting ideas simultaneously and with equal vigor. In such a case, you stalemated yourself. You may believe that you have a right to health, and yet, with equal intensity, believe that the human condition is by nature tainted. So you will try to be healthy and not healthy at the same time, or successful and not successful, according to your individual system of beliefs. For later in the book, you will see how your beliefs will generally fall into a system of related ideas. This is the end for the evening. Very good, Seth. Pleasantly, I am glad you approve. Good night. I bid you a fond good evening, and a hearty introduction to good beliefs. Your beliefs generate emotion. She's sixty-four. It is somewhat fashionable to place feelings above conscious thoughts. The idea being that emotions are more basic and natural than conscious reasoning is. The two actually go together, but your conscious thinking. Largely determines your emotions, and not the other way around. Your beliefs generate the appropriate emotion that is implied. A long period of inner depression does not just come upon you. Your emotions do not betray you. Instead, over a period of time, you have been consciously entertaining negative beliefs that then generated the strong feelings of despondency. If emotion could be trusted above conscious reasoning. Then there would be little point in aware thought at all. You would not need it. You are not needed. You are not at the mercy of your emotions either, for they are meant to follow the flow of your reasoning. Your mind is meant to perceive the physical environment clearly, and its judgments about the environment then activate the body's mechanisms to bring about proper response. If your beliefs about existence are fearful. Then the emotional reactions will be those leading to stress. Your own value judgments need examination in such a case. Your imagination, of course, fires your emotions, and it also follows our beliefs faithfully, as you think so you feel, and not the other way around. Later, we will have some comments regarding hypnotism. Here, let me mention that in those terms, you hypnotize yourself constantly. With your own conscious thoughts and suggestions, the term hypnosis merely applies to a quite normal state in which you concentrate your attention, narrowing your focus to a particular area of thought or belief. You concentrate with great vigor upon one idea, usually to the exclusion of others. It is a quite conscious performance. As such, it also portrays the importance of belief for using hypnosis. You force. Feed a belief to yourself or one given to you by another, a hypnotist. But you concentrate all of your attention upon the idea presented. Here, as in normal life, your emotions and actions follow your beliefs. If you believe you are sick, then for all intents and purposes you are sick. If you believe that you are healthy, then you are healthy. There is much written about the nature of healing, and there will be material in this book dealing with it. But there is also healing in reverse, in which case an individual loses a belief in his or her health and accepts a D five in accepts D sixty five in idea of personal illness. Here, the belief itself will generate the negative emotions that will indeed bring about a physical or emotional illness. The imagination will follow, painting dire mental pictures of a particular condition. Before long, physical data bears out the negative belief. Negative in that it is far less desirable than a concept of health. I mention this here simply because, in the overall development of an individual, an illness may also be used as a method to achieve another constructive end. In such a case, belief would also be involved. Such a person would have to believe that an unhealthy condition was the best way to serve another purpose. Other means would seem closed to him because of various personal beliefs that would fall a vacuum in his experience. That is, he would see no other way, perhaps, to achieve the same end.
This will be discussed much more thoroughly later in the book. One belief, of course, can be dependent upon many others, each generating its own emotion and imaginative reality. The belief in illness itself depends upon a belief in human unworthiness, guilt, and imperfection. For example, the mind does not hold just active beliefs; it contains many others in a passive state. These lie latent, ready to be focused upon and used. Any of them can be brought to the fore when a conscious thought acts as a stimulus. If you are focusing upon ideas of poverty, illness, or lack, for example. Your conscious mind also holds latently concepts of health, vigor, and abundance. If you divert your thoughts from the negative ideas to the positive ones, then your concentration will begin to alter the balance. The vast reservoir of energy and potential within you is called into action under the leadership of your conscious mind, because you are reasoning as creatures, because you have available such varieties of experience. The your human species developed reasoning abilities that are meant to evolve and grow as they are used. Your consciousness expands as you use it. You become more conscious as you exercise these faculties. A flower cannot write a poem about itself. You can, and in so doing, your own consciousness turns around about itself. It literally becomes more than it was. Existing in such diversified, rich environment possibilities, the 66E6E human psyche needed and developed a conscious mind that could make fairly concise and accurate minute-by-minute minute judgments and evaluations. As the conscious mind grew, now so did the range of imagination. The conscious mind is a vehicle for the imagination in many ways. The greater its knowledge. The further the reach of imagination, in return, imagination enriches conscious reasoning and emotional experience. You have not learned to use your consciousness properly or fully, so that it seems that imagination, emotions, and reasoning are separate faculties, or sometimes set against each other. The mature conscious mind once more accepts data from the exterior world and from the interior one. It is only when you believe that consciousness must be attuned only to exterior conditions that you force it to cut itself off from inner knowledge, intuitional voices, and the depths from which it springs. I am not minimizing the importance of the inner self. All of its infinite resources are placed at the disposal of your conscious mind, however, and for your conscious purposes. There has been, on the one hand, a too great reliance upon the conscious mind, while its characteristics and mechanisms were misunderstood, so that proponents of the conscious reasoning mind above all theories advocate a use of intellect and reasoning powers, while not recognizing their source in the inner self. The conscious mind was the conscious mind was there, therefore, expected to perform alone, so to speak. Ignoring the highly intuitive inner information that is also available to it, it was not supposed to be aware of such data. Yet any individual knows quite well that intuitive hunches, inspiration, precognitive information, or clairvoyant material has often risen to conscious knowledge. Usually, it is shoved away and disregarded because you have been taught that the conscious mind should not hold with such nonsense. So you have been told to trust your conscious mind, while at the same time you were led to believe it could only be aware of stimuli that came to it from the outside physical world. On the other hand, there are those who stress the great value of the inner self, the emotional being, at the expense of the conscious mind. These theories hold that the intellect and usual consciousness. Are far inferior to the inner unconscious portions of being, and that all the answers are hidden from view. Pause. The followers of this belief consider the conscious mind in such derogatory terms that it almost seems to be a supercilious cancer that sprouted like a growth upon man's psyche, impeding rather than aiding his progress and understanding. Both groups ignore the miraculous unity of the psyche, the fine natural interworkings that exist between the so-called conscious mind 
and the so-called unconscious mind and the so-called unconscious, the incredibly rich interaction as each gives side 68 and takes. The unconscious simply contains great portions of your own experience in which you have been taught not to believe. Again, your conscious mind is meant to look into the exterior world and into the interior one. The conscious mind is a vehicle for the expression of the soul in corporeal terms. It is your method of assessing temporal experience according to the beliefs that it holds about the nature of reality. It automatically causes the body to react in certain ways. I cannot say this often enough. Your beliefs form your reality, your body and its condition, your personal relationships, your environment and en masse your civilization and world. Your beliefs automatically attract the appropriate emotions. They reinforce themselves through imagination and at the risk of repeating myself because this is so important. Imagination and feeling follow your beliefs. It is not the other way around. If... Now, a brief, innocuous enough example, you meet an individual often enough and think, he gives me a pain in the neck. It is surely no coincidence that you find yourself with a painful neck in future encounters with this person. The suggestion is quite a conscious one, however emphatically, given by yourself and carried out not symbolically but most practically, most literally. In other words... The conscious mind gives its orders and the inner self carries them out. In this existence you are physically oriented. Surely then the conscious, physically oriented mind is the one that is meant to make deductions about the nature of physical reality. Otherwise you would have no free will. 10. 10. In Western culture since the Industrial Revolution after about 1760, the idea grew that there was little connection between the objects in the world and the individual. Now, this is not a history book, so I will not go into the reasons behind this idea, but will merely mention that it was an overreaction, in your terms at least, to previous religious concepts. Before that time, man did believe that he could affect matter and the environment through his thoughts. With the Industrial Revolution, however, even the elements of nature lost their living quality in man's eyes. They became objects to be categorized, named, torn apart, and the 69 ewes examined. You do not dissect a pet cat or dog, so when man began to dissect the universe in those terms, he had already lost his sense of love for it. It became soulless for him. Only then could he examine it, you see, without qualm, and without being aware of the living voice that protested, Jane now spoke in a much louder and deeper voice temporarily, and so in his great fascination for what made things work, in his great curiosity to understand the heredity of a flower, say, he forgot what he could also learn by smelling a flower, looking at it, watching it be itself. So he examined dead nature. Often he had to kill life in order, he thought, to discover its reality. You cannot understand what makes things live when you must first rob their life. And so when man learned to categorize, number and dissect nature, he lost its living quality and no longer felt a part of it. To some important extent, he denied his heritage, for spirit is born into nature and the soul, and for a time resides in flesh. Mem's thoughts no longer seemed to have any effect upon nature because in his mind he saw himself apart from it. In an ambiguous fashion, while concentrating upon nature's exterior aspects in a very conscious manner, he still ended up denying the conscious powers of his own mind. He became blind to the connection between his thoughts and his physical environment and experience. Do you want a break? No, nature became then an adversary that he must control. Yet underneath he felt that he was at the mercy of nature because in cutting himself off from it, he also cut himself off from using many of his own abilities. It was at this point that the nature of the conscious mind itself became so misunderstood and those unrecognized or denied powers 
were assigned to unconscious portions of the self by ensuing schools of psychology. With emphasis, very natural functions of the key give us a moment, because the conscious mind has been so stressed, while stripped of many of its characteristics, there is now an overreaction occurring in which normal consciousness is being put down, colloquially speaking. Emotion and imagination are being considered as far superior. The displaced powers of consciousness are still being assigned to the unconscious and great efforts are being made to reach what seem to be normally inaccessible areas of awareness. To this end, drugs are utilised, cults set up, and there are methods and training manuals galore, period. Yet there is nothing basically inaccessible about such inner knowledge or experience. It can all be quite conscious and utilised to enrich the reality that you know. The conscious mind is not some prodigal child or poor relative of the self. It can quite freely focus into inner reality when you understand that it can. You, again, have a conscious mind. You can change the focus of your own consciousness. There have been tyrannies propagated for various reasons by the race of man upon itself. One of the greatest, however, is the idea that the conscious mind does not have any touch with the fountains of its own being, that it is divorced from nature, and that the individual is therefore at the mercy of unconscious drives over which he has no control. Man therefore feels himself powerless. If the purpose of civilization is to enable the individual to live in peace, joy, security and abundance, then that idea has served him poorly. When a man or a woman feels no connection between personal reality and experience and the surrounding world, then he surrounding world, then he, he or she loses even an animal sense of pure competence and belonging. Your beliefs, once more, form your reality, shaping your life and all of its conditions. All of the powers of your inner self are set into activation as a result of your conscious beliefs. You have lost a sense of responsibility for your conscious thought because you have been taught that it is not what Y71 informs your life. You have been told that regardless of your beliefs, you are terrorized by unconscious conditioning. The whole following sentence to be underlined. And as long as you hold that conscious belief, you will experience it as reality. All through these pages, Jane's delivery was most absorbed and energetic. I easily felt Seth staring at me through her wide open eyes. Some of your beliefs originated in your childhood, but you are not at their mercy unless you believe that you are. Because your imagination follows your beliefs, you can find yourself in a vicious circle in which you constantly paint pictures in your mind that reinforce negative aspects in your life. The imaginative events generate appropriate emotions, which automatically bring about hormonal changes in your body or affect your behaviour with others or cause you to interpret events always in the light of your beliefs. And so daily experience will seem to justify what you believe more and more. The only way out of it is to become aware of your beliefs, aware of your own conscious thought, and to change your beliefs so that you bring them more in line with the kind of reality you want to experience. Imagination and emotion will then automatically come into play to reinforce the new beliefs. As mentioned in the 614th session in Chapter 2, the first important step is to realise that your beliefs about reality are just that your beliefs about reality are not necessarily attributes of reality. You must make a clear distinction between you and your beliefs. You must then realise that your beliefs are physically materialised. What you believe to be true in your experience is true. To change the physical effect, you must change the original belief while being quite aware that for a time physical materializations of the old beliefs may still hold. If you completely understand what I am saying, however, your new beliefs will, and quickly, begin to show themselves in your experience. But you must not be concerned for their emergence. 
for this brings up the fear that the new ideas will not materialize, and so this conscious mind, therefore, were assigned to the underground and cut off from normal use. Negates your purpose. I mentioned in the 619th session, a game in which you playfully adopt an idea that you want to materialize, then imagine it happening in your mind. Know that all events are mental and psychic first, and that these will happen in physical terms, but do not keep watching yourself. Continue with the game. You are doing the same thing now constantly and automatically with whatever beliefs you have, and they are being as constantly and automatically translated. It is the separation of self from beliefs that is so important initially, however. You are not to hammer at yourself consciously. Imagination and emotion are your great allies. Your conscious direction will automatically bring them into play. You can see why it is so important that you examine all of your beliefs about yourself and the nature of your reality. And one belief, if you let it, will lead you to another now. Much has been written saying that if imagination and willpower are in conflict, imagination will win. Now I tell you, if you examine yourself, you will find deeper and louder that imagination and willpower are never underlined twice in conflict. Your beliefs may conflict, but your imagination will always follow your willpower and your conscious thoughts and beliefs. If this is not apparent to you, then it is because you have not as yet completely examined your beliefs. Let us take a simple example. You are overweight. You have tried diets to no avail. You tell yourself that you want to lose weight. You follow what I have said so far. You change the belief. You say, because I believe I am overweight. I am. So I will think of myself at my ideal weight. But you find that you still overeat. In your mind's eye, you still see yourself as overweight. Imagine the goodies and snacks, and in your terms, give in to your imagination. And you think that willpower is useless and conscious thought powerless. But pretend that you go beyond this point. In sheer desperation, you say, All right, I will examine my beliefs further. Now, this is a hypothetical case, so you may find one of innumerable beliefs. You may, for instance, find that you believe you are not worthy and hence should not look attractive, or that health means physical weight and it is dangerous to be slim. Why 73? Or you may find that you feel and believe that you are so vulnerable that you need the weight, so vulnerable that you need the weight, so people will think twice before they shove you around. In all of these cases, the ideas will be conscious. You have entertained them often and your imagination and emotions are in league with them and not in conflict. As Seth Jane looked at the clock on our bookcase, do you want a break or do you want to end the session? Now, you may be poor. Following my suggestions, you may try to alter the belief and say, my wants are taken care of and I have a great abundance. Yet you may still find yourself unable to meet your bills. Imaginatively, you may see the next bill coming, with you unable to pay it. I will have enough money, you say. This is my new belief. But nothing changes, so you think. My conscious thoughts mean nothing. Yet upon examination of your beliefs... You may find a deep conviction of your own unworthiness. You may find yourself thinking, I am no one to begin with, or the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, or the world is against me, or money is wrong. People who have it are not spiritual, you may discover. Again, one of numerous beliefs that all lead to the fact that you do not want to have money or are afraid of it. In any case, your imagination and your beliefs go hand in hand. You may be trying to remember your dreams. Another example. You may give yourself appropriate suggestions each night, only to awaken again with no memory of them. You may say, consciously, I want to remember my dreams, but my suggestions do not work. Therefore, 
what I want on a conscious level has little significance. Yet if you examine your beliefs more carefully, you will find one of many possible beliefs, such as, I'm afraid to remember my dreams, or my dreams are always unpleasant, or I'm afraid to know what I dream about, or I want to remember my dreams, but they may tell me more than I want to know. In this case, also your reality colours your beliefs, and your experience is a direct result of your conscious attitudes. By such attitudes as these just mentioned, you put clamps upon your inner self, purposely hamper your inner self, purposely hamper your experience, and reinforce beliefs in the negative aspects of your being. Only by examining these ideas of your own can you learn where you stand with yourself. Now, I do not mean to stress the negative by any means, so I suggest that you look to those areas of your life in which you are pleased and have done well. See how emotionally and imaginatively you personally reinforced those beliefs and brought them to physical fruition. Realize how naturally and automatically the results appear. Catch hold of those feelings of accomplishment and understand that you can use the same methods in other areas. You also communicate your beliefs to others, of course. When visitors enter your home, they do not see it exactly as you do because they also view it through the screen of their beliefs. In your own environment, however, your personal beliefs will usually predominate. Pause. People with like ideas reinforce each other's beliefs. You may meet with some misunderstanding. When you suddenly decide to change your reality by changing your beliefs, according to the circumstances, you may be going in a completely different direction than the group to which you belong. The others may feel it necessary to defend ideas that all of you previously took for granted. In such cases, your beliefs merged. Each individual has his or her own ideas about reality for reasons that seem valid. Needs are met. When you abruptly change your beliefs, then in the group you no longer have the same position. You are not playing that game any longer. In the group, you may suddenly cease to provide for the others a need that you satisfied earlier. This affects both intimate behaviour and, say, social interactions. Interestingly enough, we're already beginning to hear about such frictions developing, especially from members of SP class, as they work with the ideas in this book. Other people we see regularly have similar episodes to relate. For a time then, you may experience a feeling of loss as you move from one group of beliefs to another. However, others, sharing your new beliefs, will gravitate toward you and you to them. I will say more about this later in the book, but it explains, for example, why a diet watcher, suddenly determined to lose weight, may meet with veiled or even open resistance from family or friends. Why the person who makes new resolutions may find himself baffled by associate ridicule. Why the person who makes new alcoholic trying not to drink finds others tempting him quite openly or teasing him into indulgence by hidden tactics. When someone who has been ill starts on the road to recovery through changing his beliefs, he may be quite surprised to find even his dearest allies suddenly upset, reminding him of the reality of his dire state for the same reasons. Because beliefs form reality, the structure of experience, any change in beliefs altering that structure initiates change to some extent, of course. The status quo which served a certain purpose is gone, new elements are introduced, another creative process begins. Because your private beliefs are shared with others, because there is interaction, then any determined change of direction on your part is felt by others, and they will react in their own fashion. You are setting out to experience the most fulfilled reality that you can. To do this, you have, hopefully, begun to examine your beliefs. You may want others to change. In doing so, you begin with yourself. I told you, in the 619th session, to imagine a game in which you see yourself acting in line with the new desired belief. As you do so, see yourself affecting others in the new fashion. 10. 1. 
see them reacting to you in the new way. This is highly important because telepathically you are sending them interior messages. You are telling them that you are changing the conditions and behavior of your relationship. You are broadcasting your altered position. Some will be quite able to understand you at that level. There may be those who need the old framework and someone, if not you, to play the part you played before. Those people will either drop out of your experience or you must drop them from yours. Once more, if you think of daily life as an ever-moving three-dimensional painting with you as the artist, then you will realize that as your beliefs change, so will your experience. You must accept the idea completely, however, that your beliefs form your experience. Discard those beliefs that are not bringing you those effects you want. In the meantime, you will often be in the position of telling yourself that something 7077 is true in the face of physical data that seems completely contradictory. You may say, I live amid abundance and am free from want, while your eyes tell you that the desk is piled with bills you must realize that you are the one who produced that physical evidence that still faces you, and you did so through your beliefs. So as you alter the belief, the physical evidence will gradually begin to prove your new belief as faithfully as it did your old one. You must work with your own ideas. While there are general categories of beliefs and general reasons for them, you must become personally aware of your own, for no one person is completely like any other. The old beliefs served a purpose and fulfilled a need. As mentioned earlier, you may have believed that of itself poverty was more spiritual than abundance, or that you were basically unworthy and should therefore punish yourself by being poor. See the 614th session in Chapter 2, for instance. You may take your break, according to your energy, power and intensity, you can help change the beliefs of many people, of course. In your daily physical life, you are usually concerned simply with changing your beliefs about yourself and then changing the beliefs others hold about you. You will find conflicting beliefs within yourself and you must become aware of these. As an example, you may believe that you want to understand the nature of your inner self. You may tell yourself you want to remember your dreams, but at the same time still hold a belief in the basic unworthiness of the self and be quite frightened of remembering your dreams because of what you might find there. It does no good in such a case to bemoan the situation and say, I want to understand myself, but I'm frightened that I will not like what I find. You yourself must change your beliefs. You must stop believing that the inner self is a dungeon of unsavory repressed emotion. It does contain some repressed emotion. It also contains great intuition, knowledge, and the answers to all of your questions. Listen to your all of your questions. Listen to your own conversation as you speak with friends and to theirs. See how you reinforce each other's beliefs. See how your imaginations often follow the same lines. All of this is quite out in the open if you realize that it is. Almost everyone in this society is acquainted with the old suggestion. Every three. Day in every way. I am getting better and better. Now that is an excellent suggestion given by the conscious self to other portions of your being. The results of such a suggestion would also follow your conscious beliefs, however. Earlier, I used I am a dependable parent as an example of a belief. See the 618th session in Chapter 3. If to you this means, I give great attention to seeing that my children brush their teeth, eat enough and perform properly, then you will interpret the better and better suggestion in that light. If the belief means to you that love for children is best expressed in those terms, if you feel that there is something embarrassing about expressing affection directly, then the better and better suggestion may only reinforce that belief. You may become more and more efficient in that manner. This is why it is vital that you examine your beliefs for yourself and understand what they mean to you personally. If, using that example, 
you suddenly begin to realise your position and begin to express your love to your children directly, you may find them quite surprised, delighted but confused. It may take them a while to understand your reactions, but as the old reality had a cohesiveness, so will the new. You must therefore understand and examine your beliefs, realise that they form your experience and consciously change those that do not give the effects you want. In such an examination, you will be aware of many excellent beliefs that work for you. Trace these through. See how they were followed by your imagination and emotions. If possible, look in your own past for points where recognisable new idea came to you and beneficially changed your experience. Ideas not only alter the world constantly, they make it constantly. Now, we are nearly at the end of Chapter 4. I will give you both a rest and we will resume at our next session. My heartiest regards to you both. Chapter 6. The Body of Your Beliefs and the Power Structures of Beliefs This is the heading. Quite literally, you live in the body of your beliefs. You perceive through the body of your beliefs. Your beliefs can increase your vision or diminish it. They can increase or diminish your hearing or any sense function. If, for example, you believe that after a certain time of life hearing, 102 will fade, then so it will. You will begin to use the faculty less and less, unconsciously transfer your attention to the other senses to compensate and rely less and less upon your ears until the functions themselves do atrophy. Period. Period. Functions in this particular regard are habits. You simply forget how to hear properly, following your belief. All of the minute manipulations necessary to hearing are unconsciously repressed. The actual physical deterioration then does indeed follow. The deterioration, however, does not occur first, but after. The same kind of development can occur in almost any physical category. Usually more than one belief is involved. Parallel with the belief that vision will fail, you may have the before mentioned belief that hearing will dim, and these two ideas may be reinforced by a belief that age automatically makes you less a person, turning you into an individual who can no longer relate in the daily pattern of environment. The belief, you see, would work to ensure the materialization of that state, cause. On the other hand, you may believe that wisdom grows with age, that self-understanding brings a peace of mind not earlier known, that the keen mind is actually far better able to assess the environment and that the physical senses are much more appreciative of all stimuli. And so those conditions will be physically met in your experience. The physical apparatus itself, following your beliefs, will continue in health. You must understand, again, that your ideas and thoughts do not exist as phantoms or shadow images without substance. They are electromagnetic realities. The ideas, however, are tools given to you for your use in your own way. The more often you use these mental implements, the more proficient you become in developing and fulfilling your own unique gifts. There are those in your world to whom you can turn for help, often friends, confidants or doctors, psychologists and psychics. According to where you are, any of these persons may be of assistance. The ideas, however, are tools given to you for your use, in your own way. The more often you use these mental implements, the more proficient you become in developing and fulfilling your own unique gifts. There are those in your world to whom you can turn for help, often friends, confidants or doctors, psychologists and psychics. According to where you are, any of these persons may be of assistance. While such help may be welcomed, the kind of value I offer is of a different nature. In larger terms, one of my most important messages is simply this. You are a multidimensional personality and within you lies all the knowledge about yourself, your challenges and problems that you will ever need to know. Others can help you in their own way 
and at certain levels of development. Such help is necessary and good. But my mission is to remind you of the incredible power within your own being and to encourage you to recognize and use it. To this end, through Rubert, I am producing the continuing body of the Seth material and books, each in a different way geared to these goals in my present book, The Nature of Personal Reality. A Seth book, I am including techniques that will allow you and thousands of others to use these ideas in normal daily living to enrich the life that you know and to help you understand and solve your problems. While it may not seem so at the present, the greatest gift I can give you is to reaffirm the integrity of your own being. I say this also because I am aware of your present status even as other portions of your own entity air. Rupert has only so much time available and much must be taken into consideration. I am personally aware of your letter. Rupert cannot answer all mail personally, however, or his work and mine could suffer. I am composing this note, therefore, to let you know that I hold you in my mind and that energy is automatically sent out to you when your letter is received and when this reply is sent. The energy will help release your own understanding and healing abilities or help you in whatever particular area help is required. Such energy is always available, whether you write to me or not. Such energy is constantly at your own command. If you believe me, then you will realize that others at best can only act as intermediaries, middlemen, and are in that respect not needed, for the energy is always available in your life. I simply give you that which is your own. Seth, thank you. Now give us a moment, and that is the end of our letter. Some people you will want to send it to, and some you will not. Others you can take care of yourselves. We think it of interest to include Seth's letter in his book, since it stresses the importance of beliefs. Dictation. Try a simple experiment. The results will be self-explanatory. Think of a sad event from your life. Similar feelings will soon follow, and with them memories of other such unpleasant episodes strung together through association. Scenes, odours, words, perhaps half forgotten, will suddenly come upon you with new freshness. Your thoughts will activate the appropriate feelings. Beneath your awareness, however, they will also trigger the cell's ever-present memory imprints of stimuli received when those events occurred. There is, to some extent now, a cellular memory playback and, on the part of the entire body, the recognition of its state at that time. If you pursue such sorrowful thoughts persistently, you are reactivating that body condition. Think of one of the most pleasant events that ever happened to you and the reverse will be true, but the process is the same. This time, the associated memories are pleasant and the body changes accordingly. Remember, these mental associations are living things. They are formations of energy assembled into invisible structures through processes quite as valid and complicated as the organization of any group of cells. Comparing them with cells, they are of briefer duration, generally speaking, though under certain conditions this does not apply. But your thoughts form structures as real as the cells. Their composition is different in that no solidity is involved in your terms. As living cells have a structure, react to stimuli and organize according to their own classification, so do thoughts. Thoughts thrive on association. They magnetically attract others like themselves, and like some strange microscopic animals, they repel their enemies or other thoughts that are threatening to their own survival. Two automobiles equipped with blaring sirens sped past our apartment house, but Jane didn't seem to be disturbed. Similar alarms had been audible in the background since session time. Using this analogy, your mental and emotional life forms a framework composed of such structures, and these act directly upon the cells of your physical body. Now let us return to Augustus. 
For here we find again in one individual an excellent example of the way in which seemingly non-physical thoughts and beliefs can affect and alter the corporeal image. And you may take a break. Jing was out of trance quickly. She repeated the idea she'd voiced several times lately, that although Seth had ended the Augustus data rather abruptly in Chapter 6, he planned to return to it occasionally through the book. I asked about the title for Chapter 8. Jane thought it had come through. Although she had glimmerings of it now, she couldn't get it clearly. The sirens continued, reminding me of animals prowling about in the distance. As we listened to them, I picked up a book which an SB class member had left behind last night. It was about philosophy and religion in India. Oh, put it down, Jane said, as I began to leaf through it. This is one of those times when Seth could give a whole bunch of stuff on that book, meaning, of course, that now she had more than one channel available. She went on to explain that to her way of thinking, the book was more insidious than a lot of outright lies, because the truth that you instinctively feel it contains could lead you to accept the greater distortions that are also in it. Now, first of all, Augustus had been told in various ways, quote, you think too much, you should be doing something physical, involved in sports, more outgoing. Such repeated remarks, with other childhood conditions, made him afraid of his own mental activity. He also felt unworthy, so how could his thoughts be good? Feelings of violence accumulated early, but in his family there were no acceptable ways of releasing normal aggressive feelings. When these built up into felt, violent eruptions, Augustus was only the more convinced of his unacceptable nature. For some time in his normal state as a teenager, he tried harder and harder to be good. This meant the banishing of thoughts or impulses that were sexually inspired along various lines, aggressive or even just unconventional. Considerable energy was used to inhibit these portions of his inner experience. The denied mental events did not disappear, however. They increased in intensity and were kept apart from his safer usual thoughts. In such a way, Augustus actually created a mental structure whose organization followed the principles I mentioned before your break. Under other circumstances and possessing different characteristics, another individual could damage a physical organ by literally attacking it as surely as it might be assaulted by a virus emphatically. Because of Augustus's particular temperament and nature, however, and his native, though conventionally undeveloped, creativity, he formed a structure rather than destroying one. In his normal state, he accepted only the beliefs he considered were expected of him. As mentioned, in the 628th session in Chapter 6, there was a time before his condition developed when his good self-thoughts and his bad self-thoughts vied for his attention and the body tried desperately to react to constant alternating and often contradictory concepts. Day 132, pause. What developed was a situation in which the conflicting sets of thoughts and feelings finally took turns, though Augustus maintained his own integrity for most of the time. But those beliefs that he shoved away were, by attraction, instantly seized by the other mental structure. Again, composed of ideas and feelings combined into what you might think of as an invisible cellular organization with all capabilities of reaction. In his normal condition, Augustus thought of his own powerlessness, for he had denied himself normal aggressive action and felt this weak. The beliefs activated the body's cellular memory, weakening the body and impeding its function. Yet for a time, while performance was dulled, it was steady. A balance was maintained that suited his purposes. He became afraid that the body would go out of control and commit violent action, because he was of course aware of the strength of the denied thoughts and feelings. When a crisis situation arose, or when he became lost in despair, an acceleration began that he pretended not to notice, and Augustus too would appear. Augustus, too, was filled with a sense of power, 
because Augustus considered power wrong and set it aside from what he thought of as his normal self. Yet Augustus knew the body needed the vitality that he had denied it. Therefore enter Augustus too with his great ideas of extraordinary power, vigor and superiority, louder and smiling. I am keeping my Augustuses straight. I hope you are too. Yes. And with fantasies of exceptional heroism and the memories of all of those denied by Augustus himself. Aggressive action, conveniently forgotten by Augustus, was now recalled with exuberant glee by Augustus too. As a result, the chemical nature of the body was instantly revitalized. Muscular tone was greatly improved. There were changes in the amount of sugar in the blood and an alteration in the flow of energy throughout the body. I knew when Rupert interviewed Augustus that the young man identified Augustus too with the left side of himself. In his normal state, that side of the body contained more tension than the right. In Augustus too, the tension found release and the energy flow became more even after initial bursts of activity. The longer Augustus too stayed, however, the weaker his position became, a fact recognized by Augustus and Augustus too. Augustus, you see, had to build up sufficient repressed thought and emotion because of a situation with which he could not cope. This threat would then bring about the emergence of Augustus too. The body behaves as you think it must behave, so Augustus and Augustus and Augustus too, with their alternating patterns of behavior, cause the body to react in quite different ways. Forget now that in this case such a division occurred, and imagine instead the successive thoughts and feelings that you possess. When you feel weak, you are weak, you are weak, you are weak. When you feel joyful, your body benefits and becomes stronger. Augustus's case simply shows, in exaggerated form, the effects of your beliefs upon your physical image. If you think, aha, then from now on, I will only think good thoughts, and therefore be healthy and inhibit my bad thoughts, or do anything at all with them, but think them, then in your own way you are doing what Augustus did. He began by believing that some of his thoughts were so evil that they must somehow be made non-existent, so inhibiting what you consider as negative thoughts, or assuming that they are so terrible, is no answer. The chapter is to be called Health, Good and Bad Thoughts and the Birth of Demons. And you may take your break. 10. 55. Jane's trance had been deep, her pace good, yet she remembered hearing the sirens. They continued now, although we couldn't see any glow. Say, from a fire in the sky over the western section of the city. Resume in the same active manner at 11.15. Now, your beliefs about what is desirable and what is not, what is good and what is evil, cannot be divorced from the condition of your body. Your own ideas of values can help you achieve good health or bring about disease, can bring into your experience success or failure, happiness or sadness, yet each of you will interpret that last remark in line with your own value system. You will have definite ideas about what success or failure means or what good or evil is. Your own value system then is built up of your beliefs about reality and those beliefs form your experience. Suppose you believe that to be good you must try to be perfect. You may have been told or read that the spirit is perfect and hence thought that your duty was to reproduce that perfect spirit in flesh as best you could. To this end, you attempt to deny all imperfect thoughts and emotions. Your own negative thoughts appall you. You may believe also what I have told Val, that your thoughts create your reality. So you become all the more frightened at mental or actual expressions of an aggressive nature. You may be so concerned about hurting someone else that you hardly dare move. Trying to be perfect all the time can be far more than a nuisance. It can be disastrous because of your misunderstanding. The word perfect holds many pitfalls. In the first place, it presupposes something completed and done beyond change and so beyond motion, further development or creativity. 
The spirit is always in a state of becoming, ever-changing, supple, and in your terms without end, as it was and is without a point of beginning. Rupert said recently that if he was sure of one thing about physical reality, it was that is was not anywhere near perfect in these terms. But in the same meaning of the word, neither is the spirit, which to fulfil the requirement of perfection would have to be set in some state of completion beyond which no fulfilment or creativity was possible. Your thoughts are. You may approve or disapprove of them in the way that you think of a storm. For example, left alone, your thoughts are as various, magnificent, trivial, frightening, or glorious as a hurricane, a flower, a flood, a toad, a twad, a raindrop, or the fog. Your thoughts are perfectly themselves. Left alone, they come and go. You, with your conscious mind, are to discriminate among those thoughts as to which ones you want to form into your system of beliefs, intently. But in so doing, you are not to pretend blindness. You may at times wish that a rainy day were a sunny one, but you do not stand at the window and deny that the rain is falling, or that the air is cold and the sky dark. Because you accept the rain as a present reality does not mean either. That you must believe that all days are stormy and make that obvious misconception a part of your beliefs about reality. So you do not have to pretend that a dark thought doesn't exist. You do not have to take it as fact that all of your thoughts would be murky, left alone, and try to hide them. Some people are afraid of snakes, even of the most harmless variety, and blind to their beauty and place in the universe. Some are afraid of certain thoughts, and so are afraid of certain thoughts, and so are oblivious to their beauty and their place in mental life. Since you have all kinds of thoughts, there are reasons for having them, as you have all kinds of geography. Within your reality, it is as foolish to deny the existence of certain thoughts as it would be, say, to pretend that deserts do not exist. In following such a course, you deny dimensions of experience and diminish your reality. This does not mean that you have to collect what you think of as negative thoughts, any more than it means that you should spend a month in a desert if you do not like them. Period. It does mean that within nature, as you understand it, nothing is meaningless or to be pretended out of existence. That will do. Now you may end the session. Or take a break if you prefer. I hate to say it, but we'd better end it then. Jovially, then I will add. I told you there would be no trouble with the book. Tell Rupert I said so. But who listens to me? Though he is listening better lately and on the right track. I wish you a hearty good evening. Thank you, Seth. Good night. Eleven forty-four p.m. Only our own weariness prompted me to end the session. I could tell that Seth was capable of continuing indefinitely. It had been a long day for us. Now even the sirens had fallen silent. Seth's joking remarks about the book refer to this one. In some recent deleted material, he had discussed Jane's initial uncertainty about signing a contract for the publication of psychic work before it had been produced. Tarn Mossman, Jane's editor at Prentice Hall. Has read the first six chapters of Personal Reality, as we call it, and has written her a very encouraging letter. Session six hundred and thirty-four, January twenty-four, January twenty-seventy, nineteen seventy-three, nine nineteen p.m. Monday. Since I hadn't finished typing the six hundred and thirty-third session yet, Jane asked me to read her the last couple of pages of it from my notes. Now, dictation. Each individual will have a slightly different definition for negative emotions. One person may find sexually stimulating thoughts delightful and a most enjoyable kind of diversion. Another may consider them impure, bad, unhealthy, or otherwise disadvantageous. Some individuals can, with ease and exuberance, imagine themselves in a fistfight, a brawl, unmercifully beating the devil. Out of an adversary, the same thoughts may fill another man with intense terror and grave feelings of guilt. This same man, however, 
who would not purposely entertain fantasies of such nature and a normal conditions, may, in time of war, imagine himself killing the enemy with the greatest feelings of holy joy and righteousness. What is usually forgotten is the real nature of aggressiveness, which in its truest sense simply means forceful action. This does not necessarily imply physical force, but instead the power of energy directed into a material action. Birth is perhaps the most forceful aggression, in your terms of which you are capable in your system of reality, emphatically, in the same way, the growth of any idea into temporal realization is the result of creative aggression. It is impossible to try to erase true aggressiveness. To do so would obliterate life as you know it. Any attempt to impair the flow of true aggression results in a distortive, uneven, explosive pseudo-aggression that causes wars, individual neurosis, and a great many of your problems in all areas. Normal aggressiveness flows with strong patterns of energy, giving motive power to all of your thoughts, whether you consciously regard them as positive or negative, good or bad. They definitely, the same thrusting creative surge, brings them all forth. When you consider a thought good, you usually do not question it. You allow it its life and follow through. Usually if you regard a thought as bad or beneath you, or if you are ashamed of it, then you try to deny it, stop its motion and hold it back. You cannot restrain energy, although you may think you can. You simply collect it, whereupon it grows, seeking its fulfilment. This will lead you to say, supposing I feel like killing my boss then, or putting poison in my husband's tea, or worse, hanging my five children on the clothesline instead of the towels, are you saying that I should merely follow through? I sympathize with your predicament. The fact is that before being assailed by what may seem to be such terrifying unnatural ideas, you have already blocked off an endless variety of far less drastic ones, any of which you could have expressed quite safely and naturally in daily life. Your problem, then, is not how to deal with normal aggressiveness, but how to handle it when it has remained unexpressed, ignored, and denied over a long period of time. Later in this book, we will deal specifically with methods to that end. Here I simply want to point out the difference between healthy, natural aggressiveness and the explosive, distorted emergence of repressed aggression. You will each have to discover for yourself those areas in which you strongly repress your thoughts, for many energy blockages will be found there. All of this will be covered in the later section. For now, consider this blocked energy. Consciously, most people are already afraid of it. They did not repress it because they considered it good. When I use the word repressed, I do not mean forgotten or shoved into the unconscious or beyond reach. You may pretend that such material is hidden, but it is quite within your conscious awareness. You have only to honestly look for it and organize what you find. It is very possible to see such information and not see it at the same time, simply because you do not add all of the data together. No one can make you do that, of course. To do it, you must have a sense of courage and adventuresomeness and tell yourself that you refuse to be cowed by ideas that, after all, belong to you, but are not you. Now... It is often said that man believes in devils because he believes in gods. The fact is that man began to believe in demons when he started to feel a sense of guilt. The guilt itself arose with the birth of compassion. Animals have a sense of justice that you do not understand, and built into that innocent sense of integrity, there is a biological compassion understood at the deepest cellular levels. In your terms, man is an animal, rising out of himself, from himself evolving certain animal capacities to their utmost, not forming new physical specializations of body any longer, again in your terms, but creating from his needs, desires and blessed natural aggressiveness, inner structures having, to do with values, space and time. 
To varying degrees, this same impetus resides throughout all creaturehood. Do you want a break? I forgot. No, I'm okay, Seth. Jane's pace was rather slow. Such a task meant that man must break out of the self, regulating precise, safe and yet limiting aspects of instinct. The birth of a conscious mind, as you think of it, meant that the species took upon itself free will. Built in procedures that had beautifully sufficed, could now be sufficed, could now be superseded. They became suggestions instead of rules. Concussion rose from the biological structure up to emotional reality. The new consciousness accepted its emerging triumph, freedom, and was faced with responsibility for action of a conscious level and with the birth of guilt. A cat playfully killing a mouse and eating it is not evil. It suffers no guilt. On biological levels, both animals understand. The consciousness of the mouse, under the innate knowledge of impending pain, leaves its body. The cat uses the warm flesh. The mouse itself has been hunter as well as prey, and both understand the terms in ways that are very difficult to explain. As Seth, Jane delivered this material. My mind flashed back many years to a summer day when I was about eleven years old. With my two brothers, I sat in the backyard of the house in which we grew up, in a small town not far from Elmira. Our next-door neighbor's cat, Mitzi, had caught a field mouse. She played with it in the grass. With conflicting feelings, I watched Mitzi, of whom I was very fond, block off each attempt of the terrified mouse to escape, until finally, having had her sport, she ate it. The Mitzi episode, in turn, reminded me of a series of little poems Jane wrote a few years ago. Many people call them haiku, the Japanese verse form, but they are only reminiscent of that category. We have several of them pinned up on our walls. Among them, this one: the cat eats the mouse. Neither exist. Do not tell them. The weather had been exceptionally warm for days. A light rain had started at session time, and now there was lightning, followed by thunder resounding across the city. At certain levels, both cat and mouse understand the nature of the life energy they share, and are not, in those terms, jealous for their own individuality. This does not mean they will not struggle to live, but that they have a built-in unconscious sense of unity with nature, in which they know they will not be lost or immersed. Quietly intent, Mam, pursuing his own way, chose to step outside of that framework on a conscious level. The birth of compassion then took the place of the animal's innate knowledge. The biological compassion turned into emotional realization. The hunter, freed more or less from animal courtesy, would be forced to emotionally identify with his prey. To kill is to be killed. The balance of life sustains all. He must learn on a conscious level then what he knew all along. This is the intrinsic and only real meaning of guilt and its natural framework. Long pause. You are to preserve life consciously. Then, as the animals preserve it unconsciously, you may take your break. I'm sorry. That's all right. It's very interesting. This had been one of Jane's longer trances. It had been a deep one too. Yet she remembered hearing the thunder when I asked her about it. She was eager to have me read Seth's material back to her. But then, oh, wait a minute! I'm already starting to get more, and I want to get up and move around first. To give her a break, I went outside to look for our oldest cat, Willie. The younger one, Rune, was in. Resume at ten forty-four. Now. The interpretations and uses to which this quite natural guilt has been put are horrendous. Guilt is the other side of compassion. Its original purpose was to enable you to empathize on an aware level with yourselves and other members of creaturehood, so that you could consciously control what was previously control what was previously handled on a biological level alone. Guilt in that respect therefore has a strong natural basis, and when it is perverted, misused, or misunderstood, it has that great terrifying energy of any runaway basic phenomenon. 
pause. If you think you are guilty because you read one kind of book or another, or entertain certain thoughts, then you run particular risks. If you believe something is wrong, then in your experience it will be, and you will consider it negative. So you will collect an unnatural guilt, one that you do not deserve, but accept and so create. You will not usually form a creation of it of which you are proud. If you believe firmly in poor health, you may use this repressed energy to attack a physical organ. A gallbladder may become bad. According to your own belief system, you may trust the integrity of your body and instead project this guilt out upon others, onto a personal enemy or a particular race, creed, or color. If you are religious-minded and fundamental in your beliefs, you may blame a devil who causes you to behave in such and such a manner. As the body creates antibodies to regulate itself, so you will set up mental and emotional antibodies, certain thoughts that are good, to protect you from the fantasies or ideas that you consider bad. If its built-in instincts are left alone, the body is basically self-regulating. It does not kill off all red blood cells if there are too many of them at a given time. It has better sense. But in your fear of negative thoughts, you often attempt to deny all normal aggressiveness, and at the first glimpse of it, bring up your mental antibodies prepared for action. In so doing, you try to repudiate the validity of your own experience. If you do not feel your individual reality, then you can never realize that you form it, and so can change it. It is this denial of experience and the energy blockages involved that build up the accumulation of unnecessary, unnatural guilt. The body itself cannot understand these blocked messages and cries out to express its own corporeal knowledge of the moment as it experiences it intently. You mentally shout in such situations that you do not feel what you feel. Over a period of time, the conscious mind, because of its position, can override the body's messages. Yet the backed-up accumulation of energy will seek outlet. The smallest, most innocent symbol for the repressed material may then bring about behavior on your part that seems out of all proportion to the stimulus. On ten justified occasions, you may have felt like telling someone to leave you alone, but refrained, not wanting to hurt their feelings, afraid that you would be rude, even though the occasion was one where your remark might well have been understood and taken calmly, because you did not accept your feelings, much less express them. On the next occasion, you might explode seemingly without reason and initiate a spectacular argument, completely unjustified. In this case, the other person has no idea as to why you reacted in such a fashion, and is deeply hurt, and your guilt grows. The trouble is that ideas of right and wrong are intimately involved with your chemistry, and you cannot separate your moral values from your body. When you believe that you are good, your body functions well. I am sure that many of you will say, "I try constantly to be good, yet." I am in miserable health. So how can that be? If you examine your own beliefs, antibodies are proteins manufactured in the body in order to neutralize toxic substances. Here again, Seth postulates inner mental counterparts of organic phenomena. The answer will be apparent. You try to be so good precisely because you believe you are so bad and unworthy. Demons of any kind are the result of your beliefs. They are born from a belief in unnatural guilt. You may personify them. You may even meet them in your experience. But if so, they are still the product of your immeasurable creativity, though formed by your guilt and your belief in it. If you shed the distorted concepts of unnatural guilt and accepted the wise ancient wisdom of natural guilt instead, there would be no wars. You would not kill each other mindlessly. You would understand the living integrity of each organ in your body, and have no need to attack any of them. This obviously does not mean that the time of the body's death would not come. It does mean that the seasons of the body would be understood as following those of the mind ever 
changing and flowing, with conditions coming and going, but always maintaining the splendid unity within the body's form. You would not have chronic illnesses. Generally speaking, and ideally, the body would wear our gradually while still showing far greater endurance than it does now. There are many other conditions, though all having to do with your conscious beliefs. You may think it is better to die quickly of a heart attack, for example. Your individual purposes are not the same, so you will manage your body experiences in a great variety of ways. Generally speaking, you are here to expand your consciousness, to learn the ways of creativity as directed through conscious thought. The aware mind can change its beliefs, and so to a large extent it can alter its bodily experience. I sat with my eyes closed momentarily, and Seth caught me, smiling. You may change your experience. You may take a break or end the session as you prefer. We'll take the break. To 11.48. Natural guilt, then, is the species' manifestation of the animal's unconscious corporeal sense of justice and integrity. It means, thou shalt not kill more than is needed for thy physical sustenance. Period. It has nothing to do with adultery or with sex. It does contain innate issues that apply to human beings that would have no meaning for other animals in the framework of their experience. Strictly speaking, the translation from biological language to your own is as given in this session. But the finer discrimination reads thusly, thou shalt not violate. The animals do not need such a message, of course nor can it be literally translated, for your consciousness is flexible and leeway had to be left for your own interpretation. An outright lie may or may not be a violation. A sex act may or may not be a violation. A scientific expedition may or may not be a violation. Not going to church on Sunday is not a violation. Having normal aggressive thoughts is not a violation. Doing violence to your body or another's, is a violation. Doing violence to the spirit of another is a violation. But again, because you are conscious beings, the interpretations are yours. Swearing is not a violation. If you believe that it is then in your mind, it becomes one. Killing another human being is a violation. Killing while protecting your own body from death at the hands of another through immediate contact is a violation. Whether or not any justification seems apparent, the violation exists. Long pause. Because you believe that physical self-defense is the only way to counter such a situation, then you will say, if I am attacked by another person, are you telling me that I cannot aggressively counter his obvious intent to destroy me? Not at all. You could counter such an attack in several ways that do not involve killing. You would not be in such a hypothetical situation to begin with unless violent thoughts of your own, faced or unfaced, had attracted it to you. But once it is a fact, and according to the circumstances, many methods could be used, because you consider aggression synonymous with violence, you may not understand that aggressive, forceful, active, mental or spoken commands for peace could save your life in such a case, yet they could. Usually there are a variety of physical actions, not involving killing, that would suffice. As long as you believe that violence must be met with violence, you court it and its consequences. On individual terms, your own body and mind become the battleground, as does the physical body of the earth in mass terms. Your material form is alive through natural aggression, the poised, forceful and directed action that is the carrier for creativity. Long pause at eyes closed. If you cut your finger, it bleeds. In so doing, the blood clears away any poisons that may have entered. The bleeding is beneficial, and the body knows when to stop it. If the flow continued, it would be wrong or detrimental in your terms, but the body would not think the blood was bad because it continued its course of action. It would not attempt to cut off all blood, considering it evil. It would instead make whatever adjustments were necessary to bring the emission to a natural halt. 
When you consider aggressive thoughts wrong, using this analogy, you do not even begin to allow the system to clear itself. Instead, you shut up the poisons inside, as an accumulation would occur in the flesh, so the same thing might happen in your mental experience. Physically, you could end up with a very serious condition, and mentally and emotionally, such a clamping down on natural forces can result in disease, idea structures that are isolated from other, more healthy concepts. These can be like growths, not lacking oxygen, for example, but free access and flow with other portions of your conscious experience. We will now end the session. My heartiest regards to you both and a fond good evening. Thank you very much, Seth. Good night. End at 12.25 a.m. Wow, Jane said when she was out of another excellent trance. I'm tired now, but Seth's still got plenty left. I'm tired now, but Seth's still got plenty left. Session 635, January 241,973. Wednesday, soon we'll be able to start sending out Seth's own letter to some of our correspondents. He dictated it in the 633rd session. I've prepared the typewritten camera copy so that it has just the look Jane and I want it to have, and now a local printer is making several hundred copies for us. Good evening. Good evening, Seth. Dictation. Now, smiling. You do not need to put in my first nows. But I had already done so. Natural guilt is also highly connected with memory and arose hand in hand with mankind's excursion into the experience of past, present and future. Natural guilt was meant as a preventive measure. It, existence of a sophisticated memory system in which new situations and experiences could be judged against recalled ones and evaluations made in an in-between moment of reflection. Any previous acts that had aroused feelings of natural guilt were to be avoided in the future. Because of the multitudinous courses open to the species, not only did the highly specific nature of many kinds of animalistic instinct no longer apply, but a curious balance had to be maintained. The conscious options that opened as man's mental world enlarged made it impossible to allow sufficient freedom and yet necessary control on a biological level alone, so controls were needed lest the conscious mind denied full use of the animal's innate taboos run away with itself. Guilt, natural guilt, depends upon memory then. It does not carry with it any built-in connection with punishment as you think of it. Once more, it was meant as a preventive measure. Any violation against nature would bring about a feeling of guilt, so that when a like situation was encountered in the future, man would, in that moment of reflection, not repeat the same action. I have used the phrase moment of reflection several times because it is another attribute peculiar to the conscious mind and, again, in your terms, is largely denied to the rest of creaturehood. Without that pause in which man can remember past in the present and envisage a future, natural guilt would have no meaning. Man would not be able to recall past acts, judge them against the present situation, or imagine the future sense of guilt that might result. To that extent, natural guilt projected man into the future. This is, of course, a learning process, natural within the time system that the species adopted. Unfortunately, artificial guilt takes on the same attributes, utilizing both memory and projection. Wars are self-perpetuating because they combine both natural and unnatural guilt, compounded and reinforced by memory. Conscious killing beyond the needs of sustenance is a violation. We are taking this slow eye. All right, Jane's delivery has been leisurely since the start of the session. The collection of unrecognized artificial guilts built up through the centuries has led to such an accumulation of repressed energy that its release has resulted in violent action. Thus, the hatred of one generation, adults, whose parents were killed in a war, helps generate the next one, thou shalt not violate, 
Again, the injunction had to be flexible enough to cover any situations in which the conscious species could become involved. The animals' instincts and their natural situations kept their numbers in bounds, and with unconscious, unknowing courtesy, they made room for all others. Thou shalt not violate against nature, life, or the earth. In your terms, creaturehood, while striving for survival and longing for life, while abundant and rambunctious, is not inherently gluttonous. It follows the unconscious order that is within it, even as there is a definite order, relationship and limit to the number of chromosomes. A cell that becomes omnivorous can destroy the life of the body. Thou shalt not violate. So the principle applies to both life and death. You may take your break. There is hardly anything mysterious in the idea that life can kill. On a biological level, all death is hidden in life and all life in death. Viruses are alive, as I mentioned in another connection, in the 631st session in Chapter 7, and can be beneficial or detrimental according to other balances in the body. In cancer cells, the growth principle runs wild. Within creaturehood, each of the species has its place, and if one multiplies out of its proper order, then all life and the body of the earth itself comes into peril. In those terms, overpopulation is a violation. In the cases of both war and of overgrowth, the species has ignored its natural guilt. When a man kills another, regardless of his other beliefs, a certain portion of his conscious mind is always aware of the violation involved, justify it though he may. When women give birth in a crowded world, they also know, and with a portion of their conscious minds, that a violation is involved. When your species sees that it is destroying other species and disrupting the natural balance, then it is consciously aware of its violation. When such natural guilt is not faced, there are other mechanisms that must be employed. Again, at the risk of repeating myself, many of your problems result from the fact that you do not accept the responsibility of your own consciousness. It is meant to assess the reality that is unconsciously formed in direct replica of your thoughts and expectations. When you do not embrace this conscious knowledge but refuse it, you are not using one of the finest tools ever created by your species, and you are to a large extent denying your birthright and heritage. Most intently, when this happens, the species by default must fall back upon vestiges of old instincts that were not geared to operate in conjunction with a conscious reasoning mind and do not comprehend your experience mind and do not comprehend your experience that finds your moment of reflection an impertinent denial of so man loses full use of the animal's regulated graceful instinct and yet denies the conscious and emotional discrimination given him instead. The messages sent as a result are so highly contradictory that you are caught in a position where true instinct cannot reign nor can reason prevail. Instead, a distorted version of instinct results, along with a bastard use of sense as the species tries desperately to regulate its course. Presently, you have a condition in which overpopulation is compensated for by wars, cause, and if not by wars, then by diseases. Yet who must die? The young who would be the parents of children. An understanding of the nature of natural guilt's integrity would save you from such predicaments. The demons, your projections, are then placed upon a national enemy or the leader of another race, Sometimes whole masses of population will project upon other large groups the images of their own unfaced frustrations. Even in Augustus, you find the hero and the villain, separate and diversified. As a man can be so divided, so can a nation and a world, so can a species and a brief break, now dictation. So, therefore, can a family be so divided, and one member always appear as a hero, and one the villain, or the demon, or the demon. You may have two children, one of whom, generally speaking, behaves like Augustus I, and one who acts like Augustus II. 
because one seems so compliant and docile, and one is so violent and unruly, you may never see the connections between their behaviour, thinking them so obviously different. Yet, if being good, polite, and compliant is not the usual state of normal children, neither is incessant violent activity. In such cases, what you usually have is a situation in which one child is acting out unfaced aggressive behaviour. For the whole family, such unreconciled patterns of activity also mean that love is not being freely expressed. Love is outgoing, as aggression is. You cannot inhibit one without similarly affecting the other. So, under such conditions, the docile, loving child is usually projecting and expressing the restrained love for the family as a whole. Both the villain and the hero will be in trouble, however. For each are denying other legitimate aspects of their experience. The same applies then to nations. Natural guilt is a creative mechanism meant to serve as a conscious spur in the solving of problems that, in your terms, no other animals ever had. By taking advantage of it, you leap still further through unknown frontiers and break through into dimensions of awareness. That were always latent since the birth of the conscious mind. Natural guilt followed is a wise guide that brings along with it not only biological integrity, but triggers within consciousness aspects of activity that must otherwise remain closed. Give us a moment. Pause. End of chapter. Chapter nine. Natural grace, the framework of creativity and the health of your body and mind. The birth of conscience. Eleven thirty. Chapter Nine: Natural Grace, the Framework of Creativity and the Health of Your Body and Mind. The Birth of Conscience. I had to ask Seth to repeat the heading so I could be sure I had it right. With animals, there are varying degrees of division between the self who acts and the action involved. With the birth of the conscious mind in man, however, the self who acts needed a way to judge its actions again. We come to the importance of that period of reflection, in which the self, with the use of memory, glimpses its own past experience in the present and projects its results into the future. Now that is all. I simply wanted to begin. All right. I bid you a fond good evening. Thank you. Good night. Eleven thirty-five p.m. The ending of the sessions was abrupt. Session six hundred and thirty-six, January two hundred and thirty-six, January two hundred and ninety-one, thousand nine hundred and seventy-three, nine twenty-eight p.m. Monday, I hadn't finished typing the six hundred and thirty-fifth session by tonight, so I read Jane the last page or so of chapter eight and the beginning of chapter nine from my notes. Jane has been on a creative binge all month. Seth's material has been infused with a driving energy. This same intentness has shown up in her sessions and sumari for SP class, and it has been very evident in her poetry. Jane is still writing her book of poetry, Dialogues of the Soul and Mortal Self. In time last week, she taped some of this material. She's also working on her autobiography from this rich bed. This has been underway for some months. From one of the apartments below us came the very faint sounds of classical music. Seth's manner was quiet to begin with this evening. Now, good evening. Good evening, Seth. Dictation. The state of grace is a condition in which all growth is effortless, a transparent pause, joyful acquiescence that is a ground requirement of all existence. Your own body grows naturally and easily from its time of birth. Not expecting resistance, but taking its miraculous unfolding for granted, using all of itself with great, gracious, creatively aggressive abandon. You were born into a state of grace. Therefore, it is impossible for you to leave it. You will die in a state of grace, whether or not special words are spoken for you, or water or oil is poured upon your head. You share this blessing with the animals. And all other living things, you cannot fall out of grace, nor can it be taken from you. You can ignore it. You can hold beliefs that blind you to its existence. 
you will still be graced but unable to perceive your own uniqueness and integrity and blind also to other attributes with which you are automatically gifted. Love perceives the grace in another. Like natural guilt, the state of grace is unconscious in the animals. It is protected. They take it for granted, not knowing what it is or what they do, yet it speaks through all their motions and they dwell in the ancient wisdom of its ways. They do not have conscious memory again, but the instinctive memory of the cells and organs sustains them. All of this applies in degrees according to the species. And when I speak of conscious memory, I am using words that are familiar to you. I mean a memory that can at any time look back through itself. In some animals, for instance, die rising of such conscious memory is apparent, yet still highly limited, specialized. A dog may remember a note added a little later. For more on dialogues, altered states of consciousness, creative processes, etc., See the notes following the 618th session in Chapter 3 and those for the 639th session in Chapter 10, where he saw his master last, but without being able to summon the memory and operating without the kind of mental associations that you use. His connections will be of a more biological nature and will not provide the leeway, pause, that your own mental conditions allow you. The dog does not recall joyful appreciation of his own state of grace from a past, nor anticipate a recurrence in any future. With the large freedom provided by the conscious mind, however, man could stray from that great inner joy of being, forget it, disbelieve in it, or use his free will to deny its existence. The splendid biological acceptance of life could not be thrust or forced upon his emerging consciousness, so to be effective, efficient to emerge in the new focus of awareness, grace had to expand from the life of the tissue to that of the feelings, thoughts and mental processes. Grace became the handmaiden of natural guilt then. Man became aware of his state of grace when he lived within the dimensions of his consciousness, as it was turned toward his new world of freedom. When he did not violate, he was aware of his own grace. When he violated, it fell back into cellular awareness, as with the animals, but he felt consciously cut off from it and denied. The simplicity of natural guilt does not lead to what you think of as conscience, yet conscience Yet conscience is also dependent upon that moment of reflection that in a large measure sets you apart from the animals. Conscience, as you think of it, is caused by a dilemma and a misunderstanding of the conditions set upon your physical existence. Conscience arose with the emergence of artificial guilt. Give us a moment. Now, artificial guilt is still highly creative in its way, an offshoot made in man's image as his conscious mind began to consider and play upon the natural innocent guilt that originally implied no punishment. You may take your break. Ten. Four. Jane was out of trance quickly. Surprisingly, she had been bothered by the music from below, muted as it was. She has very acute hearing. Her delivery had been intent but on the slow side. Resume at a faster rate at the conscious mind is a maker of distinctions. It brings to the surface of awareness whole gestalts of previously unconscious material, then assembles and organizes it in ever-changing form. Through purposeful focus, a literally infinite amount of such data can be unconsciously sorted. Then only the desired elements will emerge. The conscious mind is endlessly creative. This applies to all areas of conscious mind thinking. It is also the organizer of physical data, so natural guilt became the basis for all kinds of variations. These closely followed man's religious and social groupings. The latter are also the result of the aware mind's capacity to play upon, mix and merge, and rearrange perception and experience. Man is innately good. His conscious mind must be free with its own will. He can therefore consider himself bad. 
He is the one who sets those standards in his own image. The mind is also equipped to see its own beliefs, reflect upon them, and evaluate their results. So, using this tool as it was meant to be used would automatically help man in recognizing both his beliefs and their effects. Part of this great permissiveness has to do with the fact that man is to realize that he creates his own reality. Free will is a necessity. The leeway given allows him to materialize his ideas, meet them in physical experience, and evaluate for himself their particular kind of validity. The animal has no such need. It nestles safely within the confines of its instincts while exploring other aspects of awareness with which man is not so intimately familiar, yet natural grace and natural guilt are given you, and these will also grow more fully into conscious awareness. If you can sit quietly and realize that your body parts are replacing themselves constantly, if you turn your conscious mind into the consideration of such activity, then you can realize your own state of grace. If you can sense your thoughts steadily replacing themselves, then you can also feel your own elegance. You cannot feel guilty and enjoy such recognition, however, not on a conscious level. If you find that you are berating yourself because of something you did yesterday or ten years ago, you are not being virtuous. You are most likely involved with artificial guilt. Even if a violation occurred, natural guilt does not involve penance. It is meant as a precautionary measure, a reminder before an event. Do not do this again is the only afterward message. I am placing these concepts within your time scheme because in your terms they were born out of it. But the fact is that all time is simultaneous. In a simultaneous time, punishment makes no sense. The punishment as an event and the event for which you are being punished exist at once. And since there is no past, present and future, you could 152 just as well say that the punishment came first. We have mentioned reincarnation hardly at all, but see the 631st session in chapter 7. Yet here, let me state that the theory is a conscious mind interpretation in linear terms. On the one hand, it is highly distorted. On the other hand, it is a creative interpretation as the conscious mind plays with reality as it understands it. But in the terms used, there is no karma to be paid off as punishment unless you believe that there are crimes for which you must pay, as indicated in the 614th session in Chapter 2. In larger terms, there is no cause and effect either, though these are root assumptions in your reality. Slowly, I use these concepts, again, because of their familiarity to vow. In the world of time, they appear as real. We return once more to that moment of reflection, for it is here that both causes and effects first appear. Dimly in your terms, it can be traced by observing the animals that even now roam the earth for each in its own degree, far less than yours, shows that reflection, in some, for all intents and purposes, it does not exist at all. Yet it is there, latent. You may take your break. Jane didn't have the slightest glimmering of what that was all about. Since she was so curious, I read the last few paragraphs to her. Nor do I always try to keep material in mind. Instead, I'm usually concentrating on recording it, checking with Seth when I'm in doubt about a word, asking that worthy to repeat a phrase when I fall behind in the notes. Resume at a faster rate at now, the greater your period. Of reflection the greater the amount of time that seems to pass between events. You seem to think that there is an expanse of time between reincarnational existences, that one follows the other as one moment seems to follow another. Because you perceive a reality of cause and effect, you hypothesize a reality in which one life affects the next one. With your theories of guilt and punishment, you often imagine that you are hampered in this existence by guilts collected in the last life, or worse, worseth notes in part in chapter 3 of Seth Speaks, 
Root assumptions are those built-in ideas of reality, those agreements upon which you base your ideas of existence. Space and time, for example, are root assumptions. Each system of reality has its own set of such agreements. When I communicate within your system, I must use and understand the root assumptions upon which it is based, accumulated through the centuries. These multiple existences, however, are simultaneous and open-ended. In your terms, the conscious mind is growing toward a realization of the part it has to play in such multidimensional reality. It is enough that you understand your part in this existence. When you fully comprehend that you form what you think of as your current reality, all else will fall into place. Your beliefs, thoughts and feelings are instantly materialized physically. Their earthly reality occurs simultaneously with their inception, but in the world of time, lapses between appear to occur. So I say one causes the other, and I use those terms to help you understand, but all are at once. So are your multiple lives occurring as the immediate realization of your being in the natural extension of your being in the natural extension of its many faceted abilities. At once does not imply a finished state of perfection, nor a cosmic situation in which all things have been done, for all things are still happening. You are still happening, but both present and future selves, and your past self, is still undergoing what you think is done. Moreover, it is experiencing events that you do not recall, that your linear attuned consciousness cannot perceive on that level. Your body has within it the miraculous strength and creative energy with which, in your terms, it was born. You most probably take this to mean that I am implying the possibility of an unending state of youth. While youth can be physically prolonged far beyond its present duration, that is not what I am saying. Physically, your body must follow die nature into which you were born, and in that context the cycle of youth and age is highly important. In some ways, the rhythm of birth and death is like a breath taken and exhaled. Feel your own breath as it comes and goes. You are not it, yet it comes into you and leaves you, and without its continuous flow you could not physically exist, just so your lives go in and out of you, you and yet not you. And a portion of you, while letting them all go, remembers them and knows their journey. Imagine where your breath goes when it leaves your body, how it escapes through an open window perhaps, and becomes a part of the space outside, where you would never recognize it. And when it has left you, it is no longer a part of what you are, for you are already different. Ti li li, you have lived and not you, while they are of you. Close your eyes, think of your breaths as lives, and you the entity through which they have passed and are passing. Then you will feel your state of grace and all artificial guilts will be meaningless. None of this negates the supreme and utter integrity of your individuality, for you are as well the individual entity through whom the lives flow, and the unique lives that are expressed through you. No one atom of air is like another. Each, in its own way, is aware and capable of entering into greater transformations and organizations filled with infinite potential as your breath leaves you and becomes part of the world, free, so do your lives leave you and continue to exist in your terms. You cannot confine a personality that you were to a particular century that is finished and deny it other fulfillments, for even now it exists and has fresh experience. As your moment of reflection gave birth to consciousness, as you think of it, for both really came together, so then can another phenomenon and kind of reflection give birth to at least some dim conscious awareness of the vast dimensions of your own reality. The animal moves, say, through a forest. You move through psychic, psychological and mental areas in the same way. Through his senses, the animal gets messages from distant areas that he cannot directly perceive and of which he is largely unaware. And so do you. Am I speaking too softly? No, 
although I'd had to ask Seth to repeat several phrases. End of dictation, lauder, end of session. It's been very interesting. It's been very interesting. And my heartiest good wishes. Thank you. Good night. Jane's trance bad been very deep, her pace steady and intent. She yawned several times. Seth was right there, she said, ready with more material. But I'm tired. I wish I were in bed this minute. Session 637, January 311,973, 9.5 p.m. Wednesday, before Seth began book dictation. He spent 15 minutes answering two questions we had for others. Now, give us a moment for dictation. The you that you consider yourself is never annihilated. Your consciousness is not snuffed out. It's swallowed, blissfully unaware of itself, in some nirvana. You are as much a part of a nirvana now as you will ever be. To some extent, we have discussed your body and its composition of cells in the 632nd session of Chapter 7. For instance, all of the cells that now make up your physical form obviously exist at once. Imagine that you have many lives enduring in the same fashion. Instead of cells, then, you have selves. I told you that each cell has its own memory. The self-memory is, of course, a far greater dimension. Think of the greater you. Call it the entity, if you want to, as forming a psychic structure quite as real as your physical one, but composed of many selves. As each cell of your body has its position within your corporeal space and boundaries, so each self within the entity is aware of its own time and dimension of activity. The body is a temporal structure. The cells, however, while a part of this body, are not aware of the entire dimension in which your consciousness dwells. They do not perceive all of the elements that are available, even in three-dimensional experience, Yet your present consciousness, seemingly so much more sophisticated, physically rests upon cellular awareness. So the entity or greater psychic structure of which you are a part is aware of much larger dimensions of activity than you are, yet in the same way its more sophisticated consciousness rests upon your own and one is necessary to the other. In physical life there is a lapse while messages leap the nerve ends. See the 625th session in Chapter 5. In other terms and on other levels, this was represented in that moment of reflection that took place as man's consciousness emerged from that of the animals. Note, I did not say that man emerged from the animals. In still other terms and at different levels, this lapse occurs. This moment of reflection extends itself. As the self leaps clear of physical form, even as the cell at one time deserts the body. Then Buddhism, nirvana, a state of heavenly perfection, is achieved by the extinction of individual life and the soul's absorption into the Supreme Spirit. In a recent SP class session, however, Seth said, there is nothing more deadly than nirvana. At least your Christian concepts give you some twilight hopes of a stifling and boring paradise, where your individuality can at least express itself and nirvana extends no such comfort. Instead, it offers you the annihilation of your personality in a bliss that destroys the integrity of your being. Run from such bliss. In this regard now, and for the sake of our analogy only, think of the life of the self as one message leaping across the nerve cells of a multidimensional structure. Again, as real as your body, and consider it also as a greater moment of reflection on the part of such a many-sided personality. I make these analogies because they are pertinent, yet I am aware that they can make you feel small or fear for your identity. You are more than a message, say, passing through the vast reaches of a super-self. You are not lost in the universe. In a book, we must use words but such analogies can, if you let them, conjure up within your imagination some feeling of your intimate relationship with all other reality. To some extent, the feeling of grace is your emotional recognition of the necessity, purpose and freedom 
the innate appreciation of your rightness and your place in existence. Do you want a break? No. Remember also, in your terms now, the great gulf that separates you as a self from those cells that physically compose you. Your own present identity contains the knowledge and memory of all those simultaneous existences, even as the cells in their way retain memory of all those physical structures which they have formed. Consciously, because of your time concepts, you will interpret those simultaneous lives in reincarnational terms, one seemingly before the other. You may take your break, 9.52 to 10.7, 7, 9.52 to 10.7, 7, 9, your conscious ideas, expectations and beliefs direct the health and activity of the period. The cells do not have free will in your terms. They have the innate capacity to form other organisations, but not while affiliated with you. To leave you, they must change their form. To some extent, you determine their good health within the framework of their nature. They also help maintain yours. Pause. In terms of consciousness, the entity or greater you knows as much more than you know, as you know more than yourselves. Humorously, Seth made sure I noted down the last sentence correctly. You, however, do have free will, for while the entity's psychic structure can be compared to the body, it is a part of and inhabits far greater dimensions. All of this may seem to have little to do with your personal reality. Yet your daily experience is as connected with yourself or entity, abruptly louder, briefly, as it is with the cells of your physical form. There is an obviously intimate relationship between each cell and another. There is a constant give and take and grouping of awareness within the body's own miraculous corporeal structure. Your idea of reality and its experience is much different than that of any cell, yet each is interconnected. A group of cells forms an organ. A group of cells forms a soul. I'm not telling you that you do not have a soul to call your own. Again, louder, with a smile, you are a part of your soul. It belongs to you and you to it. You dwell within its reality as a cell dwells within the reality of an organ. The organ is temporal in your terms. The soul is not. The cell is material in your terms. The self is not. The entity then, or greater self, is composed of souls. Pause. Because the body exists in space and time, the organs have specific purposes. They help keep the body alive and they must stay in place. The entity has its existence in multitudinous dimensions, its souls free to travel within boundaries that would seem infinite to you. As the smallest cell within your body participates to its degree in your daily experience, so does the soul to an immeasurably greater extent share in the events of the events of the entity. You possess within yourself all of those potentials in which consciousness creatively takes part. The cell does not need to be consciously aware of you in order to fulfill itself, even though your expectations of health largely influence its existence, but your recognition of the soul and entity can help you direct energies from these other dimensions into your daily life. You, dear reader, are in the process of expanding your psychic structure as of becoming a conscious participator with the soul, in certain terms of becoming what your soul is, as cells multiply and grow within their own nature and the physical framework, so do selves evolve. In terms of value fulfillment, I've always thought Seth's term, value fulfillment, a particularly evocative one. He was using it not long after these sessions began. In the 44th session for April 15th, 1964, one find him saying, in part, growth in your camouflage physical universe involves the taking up of more space. Actually, in our inner universe, growth exists in terms of the value or quality expansion of which I have spoken and does not, one repeat, does not 158 souls are also creative psychic structures ever 
changing and yet always retaining individual integrity, pause, and all are dependent one upon the other. Souls make up the life of the entity in those terms. Yet the entity is more than the soul is. Take a break. Ten, thirty-seven, Jane thirty-seven. Jane's trance had been very deep. She seemed to pop out of it quickly. Set, I am so far out. Her voice was getting roof. I feel like we've gotten a fantastic amount of material through, not in terms of time, but in content. Resume at eleven one. Now, when you are aware of the existence of the entity and of the soul, you can consciously draw upon their greater energy, understanding, and strength. It is inherently available, but your conscious intent brings about certain changes in you that automatically trigger such benefits. The results will be felt down to the smallest cells within your body, and will affect even the most seemingly mundane events of your daily life. You are growing in consciousness; therefore, using it expands its capabilities. It is not a thing, but an attribute and characteristic. That is why our understanding and desire are so important. The processes initiated are beyond your normal awareness. They occur automatically with your intent if you do not block them through fear, doubt, or opposing beliefs. Long pause. Imagine yourself as a portion of an invisible universe, but one in which all the stars and planets are conscious and full of indescribable energy. You are aware of this. Think of this universe as having the form of a body. If you want to visualize its outline, brilliant against the sky. The suns and planets are your cells, each filled with energy and power, but awaiting your direction. Then see this image exploding into your own consciousness, which is unbelievably bright. Realize that it is a portion of a far greater multi-dimensional structure, spread out in an even richer dimension. Feel the entity sending you energy as you send energy to your cells. Let it fill your being, and then direct it physically any place within your body that you choose. If instead there is a physical event that you strongly desire, then use imply any sort of space expansion. Nor does it imply, as growth does in your camouflage universe, a sort of projection into time. I am giving it ethos materials to you in as simple terms as possible. If growth is one of the most necessary laws of your camouflage universe, value fulfillment corresponds to it in the inner reality universe. That energy to imagine its actual occurrence as vividly as you can. If you follow these directions and understand the meaning for them as given, you will find the results most startling and effective. Energy may be directed to any portion of the body, and if you do not block its actions by disbeliefs, that portion will be cured. Remember, however, if you hold the belief that you are a sickly person, that can hinder you. In that case, then too, that particular kind of belief is your first concern. Pause. One of the purposes of this book is to tell you that no one is born to be a sickly person, so reading it can help you there. In your terms, if you believe that you chose illness to compensate for a past life deficiency, then it will help you to realize that you form your reality now in your present and can therefore change it. Later, we will discuss such matters as birth defects. Here we are speaking about conditions that can be physically corrected, but not the growth of an arm if you were born without one, for example. Or the correction of other lacks in the body at birth. Do you want a break? No. Your body is the basic product of your creativity on a physical level. From its integrity, all other constructions in your lifetime must come. Your greatest artistic endeavors must arise out of the soul. In flesh with hyphens, you create yourselves on a daily basis. Changing your form according to the incalculable richness of your multitudinous abilities, very positively, so out of the soul's resplendent psychic richness, do you spring with your free will and desire. You in turn create other living creatures. You also produce forms of art, 
fluid living constructs that you do not understand in terms of societies and civilizations, and all of these flow through your alliance with flesh and blood. This creativity, the strongest force within all reality, reaches from sources we have not as yet discussed in this book down to the smallest atom and molecule. Your health is an extension of your creativity. So is your relationship with your mate, your boss, and the kinds of events with which you are uniquely familiar. Now give us a moment, and if you want to, rest your hand. Next chapter heading. This one, I believe, is nine. Yes. All right. With pauses, your body as your own unique living sculpture, your life as your most intimate work of art, and the nature of creativity as it applies to your personal experience. That's it. That is all heading. Do you have it clearly? Yes. A note added later. Seth made a mistake here, as will be seen in the six hundred and thirty-ninth session. This is actually the heading for part two. Rather than chapter ten, the error led to some confusion on our parts for a while. You may end the session or take a break as you prefer. Reluctantly, we'd better end it, I guess. Then I bid you a fond good evening. The same to you. And Rupert is on the right track, and with your help, all right. Here, Seth referred to Jane's daytime writing projects. My fondest regards. Thank you. Good night, Seth. End at eleven forty p.m. When Jane woke up the next morning, this passage of Seth's from last night's session was on her mind. A group of cells forms a soul. See the paragraph of material following the "We're used to thinking very conveniently that each of us has our own individual soul." Was Seth saying that we share a soul with others? Jane was sure that she'd spoken correctly in delivering the material. And checking, we found that my notes backed her up. Even considering the rest of the paragraph under discussion, she wanted to learn more. She wasn't taken with the idea of a group soul, say, or of sharing a soul. We decided to ask Seth to elaborate a request we'd on H make too often. A re-reading of Chapter Six in Seth Speaks: The Soul and the Nature of Its Perception. Helped remind us of the truly unlimited attributes of the soul. Session six hundred and thirty-eight, February seventy-one thousand nine hundred and seventy-three, nine nine p.m. Wednesday, a session had been mandatory Monday evening, February five, since we'd scheduled it for an out-of-state visitor some time ago, but we didn't feel much like it when the time came. Jane and I were saddened Monday morning. To discover that our black cat Rune had died unexpectedly during the night, we'd taken him in as a stray kitten some four years ago. I buried him in the garden. As far as we knew, this neighbourhood had been his home territory. Because of his particular disposition, Rune had furnished ideal companionship for our other cat Willie, who is several years older, and Jane and I. Had often speculated about the special relationship between the two. Willie had always been the boss. Part two: Your body is your own unique living sculpture. Your life is your most intimate work of art, and the nature of creativity as it applies to your personal experience. Chapter ten: The nature of spontaneous illumination and the nature of enforced illumination. The soul in chemical clothes. N X chapter. As Seth Jane. Sat quite motionless in her rocker for well over a minute. Her eyes were closed. She's often told me that she isn't aware of such long pauses while in trance. The nature of spontaneous illumination and the nature of enforced illumination. The soul in chemical clothes. Now you may take a break, and we will then begin. I'm forty. I didn't realize until the session was over that this was the second heading Seth had given for Chapter Ten. Perhaps my own lapse came about because we'd skipped book dictation on Monday. You see the material near the end of the six hundred and thirty seventh session. Now the young man, an assistant to a famous doctor, wrote and requested a session on November thirteen, nineteen seventy two. He came here a few evenings ago. 
Monday, February 5, and then attended Rupert's class the next night. I spoke to him on both occasions. He had been working with the drugs in a therapeutic framework for some time. Before this, he had wandered through India, finally following a guru. He left the guru to follow the doctor. Like many young men all through the ages, he was on his individual journey, looking for truth, overturning all stones in an effort to find those methods that would help him discover, in capitals, the way. Meditation had brought him some enlightenment, yet the guru in India told him that he must follow tries to split open. Now, this is not something you can physically perceive. Cellular integrity itself can be threatened. Rupert is quite right in thinking that this is far worse than any physical shock therapy. Worst of all, there is no need for it. All of this treatment rests upon the idea that the conscious mind is highly inadequate, that deep problems are unknown to it, that it is meant to be simply analytical and is unable to handle very intuitive or psychic material. Your beliefs alone make this so. Assaults upon your consciousness in such a manner challenge the stability of your species and insult the integrity of your creaturehood. You may say that such chemicals are natural because they exist within the reality that you know, but the body is equipped to deal with ingredients that come from the earth. Great doses of such artificial drugs are not easily assimilated and bring about biological confusion. Within their native framework, some American Indians use peyote in their own way, but not as gluttons stunning and annihilating their systems. They accept it as a natural ingredient belonging to their earthly structure. They do not try to blast themselves out of existence. They use it to increase the innate perceptions that they have. They become part of all that is, as they should, without dying as they are. They are able to assimilate their knowledge to purposefully direct it into both their individual lives and their social structure. They also use it within their own system of beliefs, of course, in which their creaturehood is understood and taken for granted. The conscious mind is seen as a complement rather than a detriment to biological being. As mentioned earlier in the 621st session in Chapter 4, there are, simply speaking, two schools of thought in current favour. One believes that the conscious mind and the intellect have all the answers – but to this school, this means that the conscious mind is analytical above all and that it can find all the answers through reason alone. The other school believes that the answers are in feelings and emotion. Both are wrong. Intellect and feeling together make up your existence, but the fallacy is particularly in the belief that the aware mind must be analytical above all as opposed to, for example, the understanding or assimilation of intuitive psychic knowledge. Neither school understands the flexibility and the possibilities that are inherent within the conscious mind, and mankind has barely begun to use its potentials. Now, I will end dictation. Do you have any questions? No. Material on your cat is there when you want it. Yes, thank you. It was too late now. Both of us were bleary. Seth had also mentioned the availability of the data about Rooney's life and death in last Monday's deleted session. And I am pleased with our contract, so are we. Tan Mossman, Jane's editor at Prentice Hall, has notified her by telephone that within a few days she will receive a contract for the publication of this book. But then, smiling, I knew about it, you see. Use good night, Seth. Louder and jovially, and do not worry about time. We can have three sessions a week if you want them. OK, this manuscript is tentatively due next October. I can do everything but the typing. Now I've got all this energy left over, Jane said, after quickly coming out of trance. I feel it going through me. I could go for a long walk or play badminton. Or even have a session, she joked. It isn't contradictory to say that Jane did have energy, even though she was tired. At midnight, she sang a short song to me in Sumari. The song was very clear, lyrical and restful. 
I had been in a low mood today, and now she tried to cheer me up. As always, I thought she seemed transported as she sang so beautifully, sitting in her rocker with her head tipped back and her eyes closed. She uses real power in Samaria at times, then contrasts it with very delicate passages. Her breath control is excellent. She's had no musical training. Jane discusses Samari in her introduction to this book. She's included a selection of Samari prose and poetry in the appendix of her novel, The Education of Oversoul Seven, which Prentice Hall is to publish this fall. This reminded me that before Seth Speaks was even contracted for, Seth told Tam that it would be published. Session 639, February 12, 1973, 9.5 p.m. Monday, after the last session, I told Jane that I was most intrigued by Seth's assigning two headings to Chapter 10, but the dilemma was hardly very complicated. Naya, I bid you good evening. Good evening, Seth. Part one of the book is to be called Where You and the World Meet. The heading that you asked about is for part two of the book, Your Body as Your Own Unique Living Sculpture, etc., given in the 637th session in Chapter 9. The heading referring to the soul in chemical clothes is for the next chapter, 10, which is the first chapter in part two. All right, now those are directions for you. Pause. Dictation. Your body is you in flesh. As I have mentioned in other books, the soul cannot affirm itself fully through bodily experience at any given time, so in those terms there are always portions of you that are unexpressed. All of your physical experience must, of course, be pivoted in the corporeal reality of the body. The energy that moves your image comes from the soul. Through your own thoughts you direct the body's expression and it can be of health or of illness. Out of a knowledge of the contents of your own conscious mind, you can definitely heal most maladies of the body within conditions to be given later. Your ideas themselves follow certain laws of creativity. They have their own rhythms. The associative processes of your mind working through the brain have great connection with the minute behavior of your cells. As you learn to use your thoughts, or even as they naturally change, resulting alterations take place within the cells. There is an orderly progression, an intimate relationship. When your body and mind are working together, then the relationship between the two goes smoothly and their natural therapeutic systems place you in a state of health and grace. I told you earlier, in the 614th session in Chapter 2, for instance, that your feelings follow the flow of your beliefs, and if this does not seem true to you, it is because you are not aware of the contents of your conscious mind. You can close your physical eyes. You can close the eyes of your conscious mind also and pretend not to see what is there. It is because you do not trust your own basic therapeutic nature or really understand the conscious or unconscious mind that you run to so many therapies that originate from without the self. It seems that technologies and inventions have done a lot of harm, and so they have. On the other hand, technology brings within your reach the great therapy of music. This activates the inner living cells of your body, stimulates the energy of the inner self, and helps to unite the conscious mind with the other portions of your being. Music is an exterior representation, and an excellent one of the life-giving inner sounds that act therapeutically within your body all the time. See Chapter 5. The music is a conscious reminder of those deeper inner rhythms, both of sound and of motion. Listening to music that you like will often bring images into your mind that show you your conscious beliefs in different form. The natural healing of sound can happen also when you do such a simple thing as listen to the rain. You do not need drugs, hypnotism, or even meditation. You only need to allow and direct the freedom of your conscious mind. Left alone, it will flow through thoughts and images that provide their own therapy. 
often avoid this natural treatment, however, and run from frightening conscious thoughts that would, in their turn, lead you to the source of negative beliefs where they could be faced. You could then travel through them, so to speak, into feelings of joy and victory. Instead, for example, many of you accept the way of drugs, where such feelings and thoughts are thrust upon you or forced out of you while you are denied the stabilizing comforts of the conscious mind. Dreams are one of your greatest natural therapies and one of your most effective assets as connectors between the interior and exterior universes. Usually they are not analyzed according to your analyzed according to your analone current beliefs. You have been taught to interpret them along the lines of very ritualized procedures. You are told, for instance, that certain objects or images in your dreams have a definite meaning, not necessarily your own, but following whatever psychological, mystical or religious school of thought in which you happen to be interested. Some of these systems do touch upon legitimate portions of reality, but they all overlook the great individualistic and highly private nature of your dreams and the fact that you create your own reality. Fire has one meaning if you are afraid of it, another if you consider it a source of warmth, and either of these two meanings will also be coloured by any of the endless variations of personal events that any individual might have encountered with it. Your own knowledge of dream symbols and their personal meaning is so opaque simply because you are not used to examining them with your conscious mind. You have been taught that it cannot understand. The great interconnections between waking and dreaming experience then escape you. You do not realize the many physical problems that are solved for you and by you in your dreams. This happens very frequently when you consciously set the problem before yourself, state it clearly and then drift into sleep. The same thing happens, however, even without such a conscious set. Dreams give Vu all kinds of information concerning die state of your body, the world at large and the probable exterior conditions that your present beliefs will bring about. The dream state provides you with a trial framework in which you explore probable actions and decide upon the ones you want to physically materialize. Not only nightmares, as mentioned earlier in the last session, but many other dreams follow rhythms of a therapeutic nature far more effectively than any that are drug-induced. Sleeping pills can interfere with this activity. I will have quite a bit to say in this book concerning the creative and healing nature of dreams and the easy methods that can be used to help you utilize those conditions more effectively. Here I merely want to point out some of the natural doorways to self-illumination and states of grace. These can be alternative courses to those who believe that there is no other way but to browbeat the ego, either through the use of chemicals or by other methods calculated to strip it of its powers, at least momentarily, rather than teaching it to use those great abilities of assimilation that it does possess. Your nature, beside possessing natural general healing abilities, has its own unique and particular private triggers arising from your experience. They can be learned, recognized and utilized by you. In this area, certain events really matter. Singular circumstances, meaningless to others, can be used to open your own storehouse of energy and inner strength. These will include both waking and dreaming events. If you remember having certain dream experiences and waking refreshed, then before sleep consciously think about those dreams and tell yourself they will return. If any activity, odd or silly as it might seem, brings you a sense of satisfaction, pursue it. Any of these natural healing methods can even lead beyond feelings of well-being and strength, physical health and vitality, to those sublime experiences of illumination and grace. Enjoyment of an art is also very therapeutic, and its creation springs from an exquisite wedding of the conscious and unconscious minds. 
I will try later to explain the deep interweaving that exists between dreams, creativity, and the nature of the reality of your experience. The most rejuvenating idea of all, and the greatest step to any true illumination, is the realization that your exterior life springs from the invisible world of your reality through your conscious thoughts and beliefs, for then you realize the power of your individuality and identity. You are immediately presented with choices. You can no longer see yourself as a victim of circumstances. Yet the conscious mind arose precisely to open up choices, to free you from a one-road experience, to let you use your creativity to form diversified, varied comprehensions. Let us make a clear distinction here. Your conscious beliefs direct the flow of unconscious processes which bring your ideas into physical reality, so while your thoughts cause your experience, you are not consciously aware of how this takes place forcefully. You cannot, as an instance, tell yourself vehemently, I want to want 180 receive illumination and expect it to happen if all of your beliefs actually go in the other direction. You may feel unworthy or believe such a state impossible for you to achieve, in which case you are sending contradictory messages. Nor can you become concerned with the ways in which your conscious purposes will be unconsciously produced, for the inner workings are not aware phenomena. The framework of sex is another natural therapeutic system if you have not already hampered its effectiveness by contrary beliefs. Natural mystical experience, unclothed in dogma, is the original religious therapy that is so often distorted in ecclesiastical organizations but it represents man's innate recognition of his oneness with the source of his own being and of his own experience. Do you want a break? The soul is not only dressed in chemical clothes, but wears the apparel woven from all of the elements of the earth. As physical creatures, you will be partially changed by any chemical or element or food or drug that becomes part of your living system, but those effects will follow the nature of your beliefs. Your dreams and the physical events of your lives constantly alter the chemical balances within your body. A dream may be purposely experienced to provide an outlet of a kind that is missing in your daily life. It will mobilize your resources and fill your body with a rush of needed hormones, creating a dream state of stress that will bring the organism's healing abilities into combat and result in an end to particular physical symptoms. Another dream might provide a dreaming, peaceful interlude in which all stress is minimized, with the overactive output of certain hormones and chemicals quieted as a result. Such dreams will be greatly effective, but only for a short period of time, unless the conscious mind faces the beliefs that have been causing the imbalance. The heavy doses of chemicals introduced from the outside, however, give you an entirely different kind of situation and add new stresses. These dilemmas condition consciousness to believe its position to be even more precarious than it was before and its sense of power and effectiveness is greatly reduced. Consciousness's experiences following such therapy may be those of elation, but it feels that any of its adventures rest on issues that it cannot understand and its capacity to deal with physical reality is less secure than before. This is not the case with natural inner treatments that are carried on in individual behavior. These are the ones that should be understood and encouraged, say, by the psychologists. The source for all of this creativity springs from your own inner identity which is never completely materialized in flesh, and so you always have unused portions of creativity at your command. You react to the body even though you form it. In those terms, there is a constant interaction between the creation and the creation and the creator, and in three-dimensional reality, the creator is so a part of his handiwork that it is difficult to tell one from the other. A painter puts part of himself into a painting. You put all of you of which you are aware into your body so that it becomes you in flesh. An artist loves his painting, 
In physical terms, it is completed when he puts down his brush, at least for him, though its effects continue. But you are creating your material image as long as you live and manifesting yourself in it. A painter does not look out of his creation's eyes into the room upon whose wall the painting hangs, but you peer out through your own eyes at the universe. Pause. You create not only the body then, but its entire experience, the context in which it takes place. You endow yourself with a three-dimensional existence. It is the framework in which you have your experience created by you as the artist gives his paintings their dimension. The trees in a landscape painting cannot physically move with the wind that may blow through the three-dimensional room. The head in a portrait cannot close its eyes if they are open, but you move within the framework of the temporal space that you have created for yourself. 1144. The features in a portrait are painted on canvas or board, but your soul is not painted on your body. It enters into and becomes part of it. Physically, you cannot contain all of your identity and that free portion unconsciously creates the flesh in your terms. Again, you direct its form through your beliefs, but the unconscious part of you does the work of producing it. Alt to get my mind on the business at hand. A man who makes a statue uses his conscious mind, his creative abilities, his physical body and the inner resources of his own being. Deliberately, he decides to create a sculpture and automatically focuses his energies in that direction. When you form the living sculpture of your body, which is far more important to you than any work of art, you should certainly follow the same course. In other words, direct your energies toward the creation of a healthy functioning body. You form your image constantly. As many of the artistic processes are hidden, so the inner mechanisms by which you create your material self lie beneath the surface of your conscious mind, they are highly effective nevertheless. As the creation of any art is intimately connected with the dream state, so is the living art of your body. Its breathing form is influenced by the great therapy of dreams. If there are chemical imbalances, they are often corrected quite automatically in the dream state as you act out situations calling up the production of hormones, say, that would be summoned in a like waking situation. See the footnote about hormones in the 621st session in Chapter 4. The role playing in the dream drama would be one in which you creatively worked out the problems that caused the imbalances to begin with. Dreams of a strongly aggressive nature in this context may be very beneficial to a given individual, allowing the release of usually inhibited feelings and freeing the body from tension. By such constant dream therapy, both body and mind regulate themselves to a large degree. So your flesh is affected by your dreams. In them, of course, one object may be a symbol, but there is no such thing as an overall statement of dream symbolism in which a given symbolism, in which a given symbol will have a general meaning. There are too many variations in personal experience. It is true that in dreams you do reach some of the deepest sources of your being at times, but even there, the expression of that being is far too individualistic to assign the same kind of unconscious meaning to overall symbols. 9.54 Again, there can be a useful analogy in the field of art. While artists all use the same material, the human experience, it is still the brilliant uniqueness or individuality pointing out and riding upon that shared human performance that makes a work great. Afterward, the critics may point out patterns, assign the work to a certain school, connect the images or symbols to those in other paintings, and then make the mistake of believing the symbols to be general, always apt, meaning the same thing wherever they are found. But all of this may have little to do with the artist's interpretation of his own symbols or with his personal experience, so he may wonder how the critics could read this into his work. Too true. And, as artist myself, 
I've experienced this critical phenomenon more than once. Sometimes the results have been laughable, but more often they've been frustrating. I've also been praised or criticised for elements that I hadn't realised existed in a painting while my conscious intentions were ignored or unperceived that can be even more mystifying. Are they talking about my painting? With dreams the same is true. No one really knows their meaning but yourself. If you read books in which you are told that a certain object always represents such and such, then you are like the artist who accepts the critic's idea of the symbols in his own work. You will feel alienated from your dreams since you are trying to make them follow a pattern that is not yours. In any case, interpretation involves but one part of the task as you try to consciously assess a dream's meaning. The real work of the dream is done during the event itself, on deep psychic and biological levels. The dream's happening affects your entire physical condition and so has this constant therapeutic effect. This result stems from the psychic situation set up within any dream drama, pause, and in it the problems or challenges of your existence are worked out. Many probable actions are taken. These are then projected into the probable future. As you come to understand the nature of your own beliefs, you can learn to use the dream state more effectively for your conscious purposes. It is one of the most efficient natural therapies and the inner framework in which much of your physical bodybuilding actually takes place. Each mental act opens up a new dimension of actuality. In a manner of speaking, your slightest thought gives birth to worlds. Now, there is one point here that I would like to make. Some of the drugs given to mental patients impede the natural flow of dream therapy to varying degrees. There is another consideration involving medicine, though as I mentioned earlier in the 624th session from Chapter 5, if you accept Western medical beliefs, I am not suggesting that you suddenly forsake all doctors, but naturally and left alone, any chemical upsets in the body will right themselves after the inner problems causing them are worked out through any of a variety of innate healing methods. The new balance signals the organism that an inner problem has been resolved. The body, mind and psyche are then more or less operating together. When new psychic challenges arise, Another round of natural therapy begins in rhythmic pattern. When imbalances of a physical nature are removed by the introduction of drugs, however, the body signals say that the inner dilemma must have been taken care of also, while this may not be the case at all, very positively. The whole organism is not at one with itself under such conditions. The problem manifested itself in a given way and the drugs then block that normal expression of the psychic disorder. Other pathways of demonstration will be sought. If these are blocked in the same manner also, then the entire mind-body relationship becomes alienated from itself. The inner mechanics are disturbed. The basic challenge not only is not faced, but is constantly denied the physical expression that, left alone, would bring about its natural solution. Obviously, there are many ramifications here, and in your society, your own belief systems must also be taken into consideration. If you do not believe in the natural healing processes, you will simply block them. Your fear of not seeing a doctor then will only cause more damage. On the other hand, if you have faith in medical help, this alone will bring therapeutic benefit. This can only go so far, though, if the inner problems are not dealt with. Often they are resolved regardless of what you do or believe, simply as a result of the vast creative energies within your being and the system of checks and balances with which you provided your body at birth. The same applies to mental conditions, which have a way sometimes of working themselves out better without your professional therapies than with them. Often cures happen in spite of your best intention treatment, one of the latest ideas is that certain mental conditions are caused by chemical imbalances. Supplying these does result in some improvement, 
but such inequalities do not cause any disease. Your beliefs about the nature of your own reality do. If medication of that sort improves the immediate situation, the immediate situation, the inner problem of beliefs must still be worked out. Otherwise, other illnesses will be substituted. It is extremely difficult to work with yourself in the natural manner when you are surrounded everywhere by the belief that certain drugs or foods or doctors will provide the answers. So, in the barrage of mass ideas to the opposite, those who try to allow themselves the benefit of their own innate healing must usually face the stress of wondering whether or not they are right. Unfortunately, the more you rely upon exterior methods, the more it seems you must rely upon them and the less you trust your own natural abilities. You will often become allergic to a drug simply because the body realizes that if the drug was accepted, all recourse to the solution of a particular problem would be cut off or another more severe illness would result from the physical cover-up of the dilemma. Natural therapy, therefore, is difficult to achieve to its fullest benefit in your society because it is constantly interfered with from the time of your birth. Yet it operates regardless of interference and is always at your command to give health and vitality to the living sculpture in which you have your present experience. Take your break. During break, there was an outburst of heavy noise from one of the other apartments. Several people seemed to be dragging furniture back and forth. The racket was so loud and prolonged that I was surprised when Jane went back into trance. Resume at a slower pace at now. Pause. Mental diseases often point out the nature of your beliefs as they agree or conflict with those held by others. Here, the belief systems are different than those of society to such a degree that obvious effects show in terms of behavior. There are crisis points here, as with many physical illnesses, and left alone an individual may well work through to his own solution. Even with so-called mental disorders, however, orientation with the body is very important, as are the individual's beliefs about his own form and its relationship with others and with time and space. Pause. There will often be chemical imbalances in such a situation, unconsciously produced by the individual, sometimes in order to allow him to work out a series of hallucinatory events. Such sustained objectified dreaming necessitates a change chemically from the normal state of waking consciousness. It is important to note that regardless of the mental or physical illness adopted, it is chosen for a reason and is a natural method that the individual himself knows he is physically and mentally equipped to handle. Now all was quiet. Personality differences then obviously have a great deal to do with the kind of illness adopted or the Mars you may inflict upon your own living sculpture. Now the inner problems that you encounter are always constructive, challenges leading you toward greater fulfillment. A problem caused by guilt, for example, physically materialized as a malady, is meant to lead you to face and conquer the idea of guilt, the belief in it that you hold in your conscious mind. The body itself is always in a state of becoming. You think of it as reaching a certain peak and then deteriorating or becoming less. That is because you do not understand it as the expression of your being in flesh. It reflects the seasons of the earth and of the flesh. In what you think of as you, it mirrors one condition with great faithfulness and abandon. In old age, it does the same thing. It shows you in flesh, both as you come into it and leave it, and here you see great variation. Many cease creating their bodies and die at a young age for a great variety of reasons. Of course, but some die because they believe that old age is shameful and that only a young body can be beautiful. Your beliefs about age, therefore, will affect your body and all of its capacities. As mentioned earlier in this book, in the 627th session in Chapter 6, you may become hard of hearing because you firmly believe that this must come with age. 
You will alter the chemical composition of your body according to your beliefs about its activity through the various portions of your life. Elements, chemicals, cells, atoms and molecules. These partially compose your living sculpture, but you are the one who directs their activity through your conscious beliefs, which then initiate all of those great creative powers that give your body its life and ensure its constant reflection of the self that you believe you are, louder, smiling after an intent delivery, end of session, and very near the end of the chapter, unless, of course, you have questions. I guess not. Then I bid you a fond good evening. Thank you very much, Seth, and my heartiest regards to you both. Dictation. Rupert did receive some information from me by using another method. Some advanced material was given to him for his own use ahead of time, so to speak. It seemed to him that the information just came, but not already prepared into words. Instead, he received ideas which he then interpreted and verbalized and wrote down for himself. That material is pertinent and belongs in this chapter. I will give it in my way now. I have often stated that the mind-body relationship is one system. The thoughts are as necessary to the whole system as the body's cells are. Rupert correctly interpreted an analogy I gave him in which I compared thoughts to individual cells and belief systems to the physical organs, which are composed of cells. The organs obviously are stationary in the body, though the cells within them die and are reborn. Belief systems are as necessary and natural as physical organs are. In fact, their purpose is to help you direct the functioning of your biological being. You give no conscious thought to the coming and going of cells within your organs. Left alone, your thoughts will come and go through your belief systems just as naturally, and ideally, they will balance out, maintaining their own health and directing your body so that its innate therapies take place. Your systems of belief will, of course, attract certain kinds of thoughts with their trails of emotional experience. A steady barrage of hateful, revengeful thoughts should actually lead you to look for the beliefs from which they are gaining their strength. You cannot do this by ignoring the validity of the thoughts as your experience, however, very intensely, by trying to shove them under the rug of a superficial optimism. Such habitual, unhappy thoughts will bring about the same kind of physical experience, but it is your own system of beliefs that you must examine. 9.22. Her eyes closed. Jane sat quite still for over a minute. The negative, subjective and objective events that you meet are meant to make you examine the contents of your own conscious mind. In their way, the hateful or revengeful thoughts are natural therapeutic devices, for if you follow them, accepting them with their own validity as feelings, they will automatically lead you beyond themselves. They will change into other feelings, carrying you from hatred into what may seem to be the quicksands of fear, which is always behind hatred. By going along with feelings, you unify your emotional, mental and bodily state. When you try to fight or deny them, you divorce yourself from the reality of your being. Dealing with thoughts and feelings as just directed at least roots you firmly in the integrity of your present experience and allows its innate motion and natural creativity to thrust toward a therapeutic solution. When you refute such emotions or become terrified of them, you impede the flow of feeling from one moment to the other. You set up dams. Any emotion will change into another if you experience it honestly. Otherwise, you clog the natural movement of your entire system. Fear, faced and felt with its bodily sensations and the thoughts that go along with it, will automatically bring about its own state of resolution. The conscious system of beliefs behind the impediment will be illuminated and you will realize that you feel a certain way because you believe an idea that causes and justifies such a reaction. 9.34 if you habitually deny the expression of any emotions to that degree, you become alienated not only from your body, 
but from your conscious ideas. You will bury certain thoughts and put up biological armour to prevent you from physically feeling their effects upon your body. In each case, the answer lies in your personal system of beliefs in those strong concepts you hold on an intimate level that brought about the inhibitions to begin with. Ed 212, if you find yourself running around in a spiritual frenzy, trying to repress every negative idea that comes into your head, then ask yourself why you believe so in the great destructive power of your slightest negative thought. The body and mind together do present a united, self-regulating, healing, self-clearing system. Within it, each problem contains its own solution if it is honestly faced. Each symptom, mental or physical, is a clue to the resolution of the conflict behind it and contains within it the seeds of its own healing. You may take a break. Jane said that during the delivery she knew, without being aware of what Seth was saying, that he was talking about the material she'd received on her own earlier in the week. Resume at a slower pace at ten. One. Now. It is true that habitual thoughts of love, optimism and self-acceptance are better for you than their opposites. But again, your beliefs about yourself will automatically attract thoughts that are consistent with your ideas. There is as much natural aggressiveness in love as there is in hate. Hate is a distortion of such a normal force, the result of your beliefs. As in the material that Rupert received ahead of time for his own use, natural aggression is cleansing and highly creative, the thrust behind all emotions. There are two ways to get at your own conscious beliefs. The most direct is to have a series of talks with yourself. Write down your beliefs in a variety of areas and you will find that you believe different things at different times. Often there will be contradictions readily apparent. These represent opposing beliefs that regulate your emotions your bodily condition and your physical experience. Examine the conflicts. Invisible beliefs will appear that unite those seemingly diverse attitudes. Invisible beliefs are simply those of which you are fully aware but prefer to ignore because they represent areas of strife which you have not been willing to handle thus far. They are quite available once you are determined to examine the complete contents of your conscious mind. If this strikes you as too intellectual a method, then you can also work backward from your emotions to your beliefs. In any case, regardless of which method you choose, one will lead you to the other. Both approaches require honesty with yourself and a firm encounter with the mental, psychic and emotional aspects of your current reality. As with Andrea, see the last session, you must accept the validity of your feelings while realising that they are about certain issues or conditions and are not necessarily factual statements of your reality. I feel that I am a poor mother, or I feel that I am a failure. These are emotional statements and should be accepted as such. You are to understand, however, that while the feelings have their own integrity as emotions, they may not be statements of fact. You might be an excellent mother while feeling that you are very inadequate. You may be most successful in reaching your goals while still thinking yourself a failure. By recognising these differences and honestly following the feelings through, in other words, by riding the emotions, you will be led to the beliefs behind them. A series of self-revelations will inevitably result, each leading you to further creative psychological activity. At each stage, you will be closer to the reality of your experience than you have ever been. The conscious mind will benefit greatly as it becomes more and more aware of its directing influence upon events. It will no longer fear the emotions or the body as threatening or unpredictable, but sense the greater unity in which it is involved. The emotions will not feel like stepchildren, with only the best dressed being admitted. They will not need to cry out for expression, for they will be fully admitted as members of the family of the self. Now, again, some of you will say that your trouble is that you are too emotional, too sensitive. You may believe that you are too easily swayed. 
In such cases, you are afraid of your emotions. You think their powers so strong that all reason can be drowned within them. No matter how open it may seem that you are, you will nevertheless accept certain emotions that you think of as safe and ignore others, or stop them at particular points because you are afraid of following them further. Pause. This behavior will follow your beliefs, of course. Long pause. If you are over forty, for instance, you may tell yourself that age is meaningless, that you enjoy much younger people, that you think young thoughts. You will accept only those emotions that appear to be in keeping with your ideas of youth. You become concerned with the problems of the young. You accept what you think of as optimistic health, giving thoughts. You consider yourself quite emotional, perhaps. Underneath, however, you are very much aware, as indeed you should be, of your reality in creaturehood. Yet you firmly ignore any changes in your appearance from the time you were, say, thirty, and in so doing, lose so doing, lose sight of your validity as a creature in space and time. You will inhibit any thoughts of death or dying or of old age. And so close out quite natural feelings that are meant to lead you beyond your earlier years. You are denying the body's corporeal existence and its focus in the time of the seasons, and cheating yourself of those natural biological, psychic, and mental motions that are meant to take you past themselves. You may take your break now. In this particular context, one of the problems arises out of the connotations given to the words "older" or "old." In your culture, you believe that to be young is to be flexible, alert, and aware. To be old or older is considered a disgrace, generally speaking, rigid, out of style, and past. If you desperately try to remain young, it is usually to hide your own beliefs about age and to negate all of those emotions connected with it. Whenever you refuse to accept the reality of your creaturehood, you also reject aspects of your spirit. The body exists in the world of space and time. The experiences you may encounter in your sixties are as necessary as those in your twenties. Your changing image is supposed to tell you something. When you pretend alterations do not occur, you block both biological and spiritual messages. In old age, the organism is, in certain terms, preparing for a new birth. The combined events of spirit, mind, and body involve not only the passing of one season, but preparation for the beginning of another. The situation includes all of those supports necessary to carry you through, not only with acceptance. But with the great aggressive drive toward new experience, to refute your reality in time, therefore, results in your being stuck in time and obsessed by it. Accepting your integrity in time allows the body to function until its natural end, in good condition, free from those distorted, invisible concepts about age. If you believe that youth is the ideal and struggle for it. While simultaneously believing that old age must involve infirmities, then you cause an unnecessary dilemma and hasten aging according to the negative aspects of your mind. Each individual must examine his or her individual beliefs, or begin with feelings which will inevitably lead to them. In this area, as in all others, those of you who are proficient verbally might use the method of writing. Either write down your beliefs as they come to you, or make lists of your intellectual and emotional assumptions. You may find that they are quite different. If you have a physical symptom, do not run away from it. Feel its reality in your body. Let the emotions follow freely. These will lead you, if you allow them to flow, to the beliefs that cause the difficulty. They will take you through many aspects of your own reality. That you must face and explore. These methods release your withheld natural aggressiveness. You may feel that you are swamped by emotion, but trust it. Again, it is the motion of your being, and it arouses your own creativity. Followed, it will seek the answers to your problems. Rubert, in his dialogues, has an excellent example. 
in the way in which he allowed his feelings to arise, though he was initially frightened of them. Everyone cannot write poetry, but each person is creative in his or her own way and can follow the emotions as Rupert did, whether or not a poem results. He will know the passage to which I refer. Use it. You must realize that your conscious mind is competent, its ideas pertinent, and that your own beliefs affect and form your body and your experience. You may take your break. Jane was very surprised to learn that she'd been in trance for almost half an hour. She thought, but a few minutes had passed. Here is part of the passage from her book of poetry referred to by Seth. Jane wrote it five days ago. In this excerpt, the mortal self tells the soul, "If you think of these as planets, then your other ideas orbit about them. There may be some invisible beliefs." And there may be one or two invisible core beliefs. These, following the analogy, would be hidden behind the other brighter, more obvious planets, and yet would show their presence through their effects upon your relationships with all of the other visible core beliefs in your planetary system. Questions you cannot seem to answer as you study your own ideas, for example, may lead you to suspect the existence of such invisible core beliefs. Let me emphasize that they are consciously available. You can find them through the approaches mentioned earlier in the last session, working from your feelings or by beginning with the beliefs that become most readily available. This subject leads to what I will call bridge beliefs. And again, Rupert received some information on this topic ahead of time for his own benefit. See the notes prefacing the last session as you examine your ideas. You will discover that even some apparently contradictory ones have similarities, and these resemblances may be used to bridge the gaps between beliefs, even those that seem to be the most diverse. Because you are the individual who holds the beliefs, you will stamp them, so to speak, with certain characteristics that you will recognize. These aspects will themselves emerge as bridge beliefs. They contain great motion and energy. When you discover what they are, you will find a point of unity within yourself from which you can, with some detachment, view your other systems of belief. Long pause. The emotions connected with these bridge beliefs may indeed surprise you, but standing upon such unifying structures, you are also free to let the emotional flow sweep past, feeling it. But aware for the first time, perhaps, of the origin of those feelings in your beliefs, and no longer afraid of being swept away by them, it is impossible to tell you of the emotional reality of such an experience. You will have to discover it for yourself. Such bridge beliefs often allow you to perceive the invisible beliefs mentioned this evening, and these can then appear to you as a revelation. On second thought, however. You will realize that another belief blocked that one from your view, but that you were always aware of it, and that in a strange way it was also invisible because you took it for granted. You did not consider it a belief about reality, but as reality itself, and never questioned it. Andre never doubted the fact that life was more difficult for a woman than for a man. See the six hundred and forty-third session. When she examined her beliefs, this escaped her. The invisible belief, however, affected her behavior and experience. Now she understands it and can deal with it as belief and not as a condition of reality over which she has no control. A one-minute pause at ten five bridge beliefs may become available to you in the dream state. If so, the conscious knowledge may appear suddenly in the middle of your waking day. A reconciliation will be felt within the self following such a conscious understanding, though the dream itself may not be consciously remembered. In the dream, various symbols may be used. Each person will vary in this regard. When such dreams are remembered, however, individual symbols, such as crossing a river safely, or an ocean, or bridging a gap or an abyss, are often involved. At such times, there can also be strong emotional content, as of finally triumphing over psychological chaos, or even of rising from the dead. 
you can suggest to yourself the emergence of such bridge beliefs. The conscious idea itself represents a statement of intent. Various core beliefs, not well assimilated, will give you conflicting self-images. Now there is a difference between freely experimenting with and enjoying various styles of dress, attitudes and behavior, and finding yourself lost in a compulsion to change your appearance, attitude and behavior. The latter usually involves contrary core beliefs that are alternately pulling you one way and then the other. Usually exaggerated opposing emotions will also be apparent. Once you understand this, it is not difficult to look at your beliefs to identify these and to find a bridge to unite the seeming contradictions. The birth of imagination initiated the largest possibilities and at the same time put great strain upon the biological creature whose entire corporeal structure would now react not only to present objective situations but imaginative ones. At the same time, members of the species had to cope with the natural environment, as did any other animal. Imagination helped because an individual could anticipate the behavior of other creatures. In another way, animals also possess an unconscious anticipation, but they do not have to come to terms with it on an aware basis as the new consciousness did. Again, good and evil and the freedom of choice came to the species' aid. The evil animal was the natural predator, for example. It would help here if the reader remembers what has been said about natural guilt earlier in this book. It would aid in understanding the later myths and the variations that came from them. See the 634th session in Chapter 8, among others. As the mind developed, the species could hand down to its offspring the wisdom and law of the elders, this is still being done in modern society, of course, when each child inherits the beliefs of its parents about the nature of reality. Apart from all other considerations, this is also a characteristic of creaturehood. Only the means are different with the animals. The acceleration continues, however. Ideas of right and wrong are always guidelines that are then individually interpreted because of the connection with survival mentioned earlier in the last session, there is a great charge here. Initially, the child had to be impressed with the fact, for example, that a predator animal was bad because it could kill. Today, a mother might unwittingly say the same thing about a car. The early acquiescence to beliefs has a biological importance, therefore, but as the conscious mind attains its maturity, it is also natural for it to question those beliefs and to assess them in relation to its own environment. Many of my readers may have certain ideas about good and evil that are very hampering. These may be old beliefs in new clothing. You may think that you are quite free, only to discover that you hold old ideas but have simply put new terms to them or concentrated upon other aspects. Your daily experience is intimately connected with your ideas of worth and personal value. Dictation. Now, you may be quite able to see through the distortions of conventional Christianity. You may have changed your ideas to such an extent that you can see little similarity between your current ones and those of the past. Now you may believe in the theories of Buddhism, for example, or of another Eastern philosophy. The differences between any of those systems of thought and Christianity may be so apparent that the similarities escape you. You may follow one of the schools of Buddhism in which great stress is laid upon the denial of the body, discipline of the flesh, and the avoidance of desire. These elements are quite characteristic of Christianity also, of course, but they may appear more palatable exotic or reasonable coming from a source foreign to your childhood education. So you may leap from one to the other, shouting emancipation and feeling yourself quite free of old limiting ideas. Philosophies that teach denial of the flesh must ultimately end up preaching a denial of the self and building a contempt for it, because even though the soul is couched in muscle and bone, it is meant to experience that reality, 
not to refute it. All such dogmas use artificial guilt, and natural guilt is distorted to serve those ends. In whatever terms, the devotee is told that there is something wrong with earthly experience. You are therefore considered evil as a self in flesh by virtue of your very existence. This alone will cause adverse experience, making you reject the very basis of your own framework of experience. You will consider the body as a thing, a fine vehicle, but not in itself the natural living expression of your being in material form. Many such Eastern schools also stress, as do numerous spiritualistic schools, also strew the importance of the unconscious levels of the self and teach you to mistrust the conscious mind. The concept of nirvana, see the 637th session in chapter 9, and the idea of heaven are two versions of the same picture, the former being one in which individuality is lost in the bliss of undifferentiated consciousness, and the latter one in which still conscious individuals perform mindless adoration. Neither theory contains an understanding of the functions of the conscious mind or the evolution of consciousness, or, for that matter, certain aspects of greater physics. No energy is ever lost. The expanding universe theory applies to the mind as well as to the universe. However, these philosophies can lead you to a deep mistrust of both your body and mind. You are told that the spirit is perfect, and so you could try to live up to standards of perfection quite impossible to achieve. The failure adds to the sense of guilt. You attempt then to further banish the characteristic enjoyment of your own creaturehood, denying the lusty spirituality of your flesh and the strong present corporeal leanings of your soul. You will try to rid yourself of very natural emotions and so be cheated of their great spiritual and physical motion. Pause. On the other hand, some leaders may give little consideration to such issues, but still be deeply convinced of the misery of the human condition, focusing upon all the darker elements, seeing the world's destruction ever closer to hand without really examining the beliefs that arouse such constant feelings. They may find it easy to cluck their tongues at obvious fanatics who cry out for God's vengeance and speak about the world's end in brimstone and ashes. They may be as equally convinced, however, of man's basic unworthiness and so, of course, of their own. In daily life, such people will concentrate upon negative events, store them up, and unfortunately cause personal experience that will seem to quite reinforce the basic ideas. Here, in different contexts, is the same denial of the worth and integrity of earth experience. In some such cases, all of the desirable human attributes are magnified and projected outward into a god or superconsciousness, while all the less admirable characteristics are left to the race and the individual. The individual therefore deprives himself of the use of much of his ability. He does not consider it his own and is astounded when any others of his race display such superior qualities. To some extent, such beliefs follow certain rhythms in both civilizations and in time. The mind is a system of checks and balances, even as the body, and so often a set of beliefs that can be seen as highly negative will often serve beneficial ends in countering other beliefs. For some time, Western civilization stressed a distorted version of intellectual reasoning, for example, and so the current stress about other portions of the self serves a purpose. The people alive within the world come into it with their own problems and challenges, and this will have much to do with the kind of national and worldwide beliefs that are generated and that dominate. The beliefs, of course, are frameworks in which various kinds of experience are tested. This also applies to religions and political and social situations as well. There is always a give and take between the individual and the mass system of beliefs in which he has chosen his environment. There is a belief in illness as being morally wrong and a countering belief in it as being ennobling, uplifting and spiritually good. These value judgments are extremely important 
for they will be reflected in your own experience with any illness or disease. Now, that is the end of dictation and the end of our session. A hearty good evening to you both. Thank you, Seth. There are too many aspects of what you think of as health and illness to discuss even in a book that is directed to personal reality in which the body plays such an important role. Health and illness are both evidences of the body's attempt to maintain stability. There is a difference in the overall health patterns in men and animals because of the quite diverse nature of their physical experience. More will be said about this particular subject later. Overall, however, in the animal's illness and disease play a life-giving role, keeping balance both within a species and between them, therefore ensuring the future existence of all involved. In their own ways, the animals are quite aware of this fact. Some of them even bring themselves to their own destruction through what you would call suicide and en masse. At that level... The animals understand and are always in touch with deep biological connections in which they know their own continuances within the chain of nature. Man grants rich psychological activity to his own species but denies it in others. There are as many luxuriant and diverse kinds of psychological movement as there are species, however. The cycle's health and disease are felt as rhythms of the body by the large variety of animals, and even with them illness or disease has life-saving qualities on another level. Instinct is fairly accurate, for example, guiding the beasts to those territories in which proper conditions can be found, and even for them, the well-being of the body represents physical evidence of their being M, the proper place, at the proper time. It reinforces the animal's sense of grace in terms mentioned earlier in this book. See the 636th session in Chapter 9, Intently. They understand the beneficial teaching quality of disease and follow their own instinctive ways of treating it. In a natural situation, this might involve a mass migration from one territory to another. In such cases, the illness of only a few animals might send a whole herd to its safety and a new food supply. Nam is so highly verbal that he finds it difficult to understand that other species work with idea complexes with a hyphen of a different kind, in which, of course, thought as you consider it is not involved. But an equivalent exists. Using an analogy, it is as if ideas are built up not through sentence structure reinforced by inner visual images, but by like mental patterns structured through touch and scent. In other words, thinking, but within a framework entirely different and alien to vow. 10.15 Seth repeated the last two sentences to make sure I had taken them down correctly. Such thinking exists using the analogy within the framework of instinct, whereas your own verbalized thoughts can also intrude outside of that framework. One of the main differences between you and the animals, and one of the significant meanings in terms of free will, is involved here. Animals, then, understand the beneficial directing elements of disease. They also comprehend the nature of stress as a necessary stimulant to physical activity. Observing even a pet, you will notice its marvellous complete relaxation, and yet its immediate total response to stimulus. So animals in captivity will fight to provide themselves with necessary health-giving stress factors. We had a window open because the night was quite warm. Now I tilted my high ad toward it, listening. Faintly above the sound of the rain, I heard geese once more. Do you want to take a break and listen to your geese? No. The eleven be gone in a minute, anyhow. They are more melodious than I am. They're certainly fascinating. But, I added jokingly, so are you, rather seriously. I thank you for the compliment. Animals, then, do not think of illness in terms of good or bad. Disease in itself on that level is a part of the life survival process and a system of checks and balances. With the emergence of man's particular kind of consciousness, other issues become involved. Mankind feels its own mortality even more than the beasts do. 
long pause. With the growth of this particular variety of self-consciousness came the exteriorization, magnification and intensification of definite elements that lie latent in other animals, the individuation of strong emotional activity to a new degree, for example. The emergence of the pause of reflection, mentioned earlier in the 635th session in Chapter 8, for instance, and the blossoming of memory along with the emotional intensification led to a situation in which members of the new species recalled in the present the dead and the diseases that killed them. They became frightened of disease, particularly in the case of plagues. Man forgot the teaching and healing elements and concentrated instead upon the unpleasant experience itself. To some extent, this was quite natural, for the new species developed in order to change the nature of its consciousness, to follow a reality in which instinct was no longer blindly followed, and to individualize in strong personal focus corporeal experience that had previously taken a different pattern. You may take your break, Jane said. She felt very relaxed and sleepy, but not tired. She had heard the geese while in trance. This was one of those times when she was consciously aware that several channels of information were available from Seth. We had but to decide which subject we wanted material on after break. How idea structures work in animals as opposed to mankind. 2. The use of animals. Rats say, in experiments involving injections, before giving them to human beings, E-man's psychological reality is so sweepingly different from that of the animals, Jane added now, that he would inevitably show a wide variety of reactions. 3. Material on Jane herself concerning her relaxed state. We chose the first category since it would continue the subject matter of this chapter. See the notes for the 616th session in Chapter 2 for descriptions of Jane's first experience with Seth's multiple channels. Resume in the same unhurried manner at now. Man has a far greater leeway. He forms his reality according to his conscious beliefs, even while its basis lies in the deep unconscious nature of the earth in corporeal terms. Man's I am is seemingly apart from nature, a characteristic necessary for the development of his kind of consciousness, led him into value judgments, and also necessitated some break with the deep inner certainties of other species. Illness, therefore, was experienced as bad. An entire tribe could be endangered by one sick member. At the same time, as the mind developed, cunning and memory became highly effective survival tools. In some societies or tribes, the old or infirm were killed, lest their care take too much attention from the able-bodied and endanger the group. In others, however, the old were honoured for the wisdom that they had accumulated with age, and this became very practical in tribes where many did not survive. History was dependent upon the old with their memory of past events, and the group's sense of continuity was also in the hands of its oldest members, who passed memories on to others. An individual who had himself survived many diseases was considered a sage. Such people often watched the animals and observed nature's own therapies and treatments. In certain eras, the lines between the species were not completely drawn, and there were long periods where men and animals mixed and learned from each other. Man's imagination made him a great maker of myths. Myths, as you know them, represent bridges of psychological activity and point quite clearly to patterns of perception and behaviour through which, in your terms, the race passed as it travelled to its present state. Mythology bridges the gap between instinctive knowledge and the individualization of idea. When an animal is sick, it immediately begins to remedy the situation and unconsciously it knows what to do. It does not bother thinking in your terms of good and evil. It does not wonder what it did to get into such a situation. It does not think of itself as inferior. It automatically begins its own therapy. A human being, however, 
has another dimension to deal with, a new area of creativity, a diverse mixture of beliefs. His or her ideas about the self must be examined, for they are being materialized in flesh. Again, the situation has great complexity, for the condition is still a healthy attempt on the part of the body to maintain balance. Overall, there is also the world situation to be taken into consideration. The status of the species on the planet in which, say, overpopulation problems will bring about death to ensure new growth. The individuals alive at such a time will also have a hand in such decisions, however. Once more, because you are self-conscious beings, your beliefs regulate your reality. An animal knows unconsciously that it is unique and has a place in the scheme of being. Its sense of grace is built in. Your free will allows for the freedom of any belief, including one that says you are unworthy with no right to your existence. If you misinterpret the myths, then you may believe that man has fallen from grace and that his very creaturehood is cursed, in which case you will not trust your body or allow it its natural pattern of self-therapy. In order for consciousness to develop in your terms, there must be freedom for the exploration of all ideas individually and en masse. Each of you are living entities, growing toward your own development. Each of your beliefs, therefore, has its own unique origin and feeling patterns, so you must for yourself travel back through your beliefs and your own feelings until intellectually and emotionally you realize your tightness, your completely original existence in time and space as you know it. This knowing will give you the conscious knowledge that is a counterpart of the animal's unconscious comprehension. Headphones are recommended when using this affirmation. That's because the affirmations bounces from the left hemisphere to the right. Dual headphones are recommended. I only believe in wonderful things. I believe life is wonderful. 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 I believe life's a gift. 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 I believe everything works out. Everything always 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 works out. I believe everything works out. I believe everything works out. I believe everything works out. I believe life is good. I believe life is good. I believe life is good. I believe I have more than enough money. I believe I have more than enough. 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 I believe I have abundance. 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 I believe one. Try to take over the world.